but they were paranoid Or it means gadgets and toys Or it means consoles and game boys Let's play with paranoid Genesis, Saturn, Dreamcast, Main Super Nintendo, Power Glove, GBA Turbo Graphics 16, we play all day I'm over here on the side. But just like we were uh, playing some of these games with Donut, we did The Council. Uh, I played one with Jay Dreamers where we played Oregon Trail. And he basically makes all the decisions and I just do the clicky stuff. This one might be a little bit more difficult just because I'm definitely not that. I mean, I'm great at video games, uh, not to pat myself on the back, but I can't do a lot of things at once. I can barely talk and play a game let alone uh, orchestrate a show and play a game and take directions. So we're going to see how well this actually goes uh, once we fire it up. So, and, and just to, just to throw some creds out there, I did win the regional championships for blockbuster video games in the late nineties, NBA jam TE and judge dread on the Genesis. Uh, so come at me on either one of those games. Although these like modern versions of games, where you got to be constantly paying attention and there's like just nothing but headshots it's a lot harder for me to to get any leeway so i do still think i can beat juan at any game that, that he brings to the table so i heard that juan might be doing some of these games pretty soon too like little playthroughs so maybe at some point uh, we can go head to head i don't know street fighter mortal kombat if there's like some in particular game that you think will be better to fight juan and just dominate him all over the floor uh, let me know what game that should be. So I don't. It probably shouldn't be a modern shooter game. Uh, like what? What are the ones from Blizzard that just came out? I'm I horrible at that game. Like the worst of that game. Because again, I like brute force. Uh, and if and if Cheney doesn't show up soon enough, I'll I'll start my brute force approach. I'm gonna do my best to what she described as like a no gun policy. So we're going to see how well that works. But if it comes down to it, I'll, I'm blasting. I don't care what happens. And I guess a, a couple of other things, too. I'm going to start using this particular show as a way to just talk about current events and just happenings and a little bit more laid back. A, because I usually shy completely away from current events. If you look through any of the material that I personally put out or the comics that I write or anything that I end up kind of like sharing or getting invested in a lot of it's like 10 to 20 year old sort of news stories or things that have had so much time and a lot of other researchers and hot takes have already kind of like come and gone and uh, there's a little bit of like security in that too that you're not constantly trying to play catch up there's there's one aspect of it that it feels like ambulance chasing a little bit which i'm not a huge fan of and that's where you know some celebrity comes out and uh, some, I don't even know what the hell just happened. Some celebrity comes out and like the, the clone thing will come up, right? And everyone just kind of like jumps on a particular story. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> Somehow I, I retreated all the way back. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So we need to pick our character, I guess. This is definitely where I would need Cheney's input, but I'm just going to kind of wing this a little bit. So we got six points. Uh, I don't care about temperament, but if we're going to do no gun, I feel like we need to be able to lie and sneak pretty well. And does no gun mean no fist? Because two handed melee might come in handy if we're going to do no gun. And honestly, this is going to be way harder than it should be for, for me to do no gun because it is my, you know, diametric opposite on how I usually approach these things. So persuade lie. Okay. Personality feels like it's going to need some boost so right off the bat i'll spend at least two points there uh man i really do feel like dexterity like 
I don't know, man. I, I really, if we're going to do no gun at all, I feel like we still need to be able to use some kind of violence. But if I'll take it literal, we're going to see if we can just do like no violence, maybe. I don't think that's possible, but we'll see. So we're definitely going to need intelligence, perception, probably some dexterity to sneak around and lockpick. And we should probably be like extremely proficient in something. How far can we go? Okay, just the high. So we got all all goods, average. I don't know which one of these to to remove to add to another. I don't care as much about temperament. I guess persuasion or intelligence. Uh, perception. Yeah. I think, man, I really, I think charm. I think charm's the way to do it. All right, let's go. All right, here we've got two points. I think we're going to want... We're going to go all in on persuasion and charm, I think. Uh, so what else can we get here? Maybe tech. We'll do... Like we'll do leadership and dialogue. We're used to being bossed around. Right. I don't have a great strategy for the reason I'm picking a lot of these. It's just that if we're going to try and do like a nonviolent approach... And then here we've got an aptitude. So who would be like incredibly persuasive, right? If we were like the NLP master, I guess maybe like a bureaucrat in a way. Because even if you know a bureaucrat's dirty, as long as they're good at being dirty, you're kind of like love them for it. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to go with bureaucrat oh, in, in lieu of uh, Cheney being here to tell us what we need to do. Let's do it. Uh, gender can we pick non oh man you only got two to pick from we'll go female i really don't care about this aspect as much so we'll just we'll just click some buttons here and see what happens where's like all the crazy can we just like tilt the nose all the way one way yeah we're gonna go pig nose pig nose broad cheek and then we'll do I want like a different hairstyle for sure. There we go. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go for the it look. Uh, go salt some meat somewhere. Can we do clown makeup? If we can do clown makeup, I'm I'm sold. Uh, now we just got kind of a be beaten look, I guess. Uh, I think I might go for this like very pale. There we go. And we don't need to be dirty. I don't know if we need any scars. Uh, all right, we're going to go for the clown look. I'm happy with this. I'm going to be clown girl for now. Can't actually see what the... Because <laughs> my camera is in the way. Okay, okay, okay. Clown girl with a slash next to it. Totally did that on purpose. It's fine. All right, I don't care. I think that's all good. All right, so we're going to be clown girl. And we're going to do our best to not be violent and just talk our way out of all the different issues that come up. So this will be a first for me on any game of, of No Fire. And I don't even really remember the whole plot of this game. I just remembered that uh, you can basically go to this large hubs, like a big mall. So it kind of reminded me of like Final Fantasy VII, where you could go into like these big metropolitan areas with a bunch of different like mini games or like mini environments. It's a similar version of that one, and I guess uh, calling up Final Fantasy VII might date uh, my taste in games a little bit too. That's what like early 2000s or late 90s, uh, right around the time that I was smashing it at the Blockbuster Video Game Championship for regionals. The only reason that I didn't go to DC is because my parents thought it was a scam. It might have been, but it was still like the Blockbuster. Yeah, I'm just going to skip some of these because I think I've seen most of the story. And even if I haven't, I don't care that much. And I and then, all right, we're just going to do skip, skip, skip. Can you hear me? And the last uh, first person style shooter game was like a samurai one for PS that I think I ended up playing. And I got like 80% of the way through and then something big came up at work. And then the second that I tried to return to it, it was a little bit of a nightmare because I don't remember any of the damn combos or the special moves or what sort of ointments to cure which poisons. So I don't know is if it's just me that forgets that kind of stuff immediately if I haven't played a game for a week or two or if that's a lot of people. But it definitely happens to me 
so often that I ended up just, I don't know, not revisiting games if I feel like I got towards mostly the end. Uh, so outside of the, the game thing, I guess I'll just start talking about the uh, the comic convention that I ended up going to. So on uh, last Sunday, March 3rd, there was a comic convention in Fort Myers, Florida. And I think it was called the, the Southwest Florida Con. Not to be confused with the Southwest Florida Comic Con. This is the Southwest Florida Con. And it wasn't bad. I actually had a good time. It was a good sort of learning experience where I had a little table. Um, I probably needed at least two or three tables. I could have made do with two, but I had one table and it was just absolutely completely filled with everything that I basically had to offer. I had little toy sets. It had coloring books for all ages. It had adult comics. Uh, it had all sorts of different things that um, maybe it was like only appealing to some people. Like I almost felt like I could have had two different tables. I could have had like an all ages table and I could have had a more of like an adult conspiracy table and it might have even done better. But I don't got the cash flow or or the uh, time yet to kind of set up two completely different tables like that. It's something to really think of. And I guess one of the things that was really weighing on my mind a little bit was like, do you lean all the way into all ages or do I, you know, keep trying to do both? Cause I really like the all ages stuff is very easy to sell. Right. And it's very popular and I could actually move a lot more of it if I just leaned all the way in, but I guess I'm not as passionate for, you know, bad or good reason. Uh, as I am about some of the more controversial topics. So I love talking about Bigfoot and I love talking about all these, you know, different cryptids, but I also really like talking about political conspiracies. So I can't, I don't think I'm streaming. I'm not streaming YouTube. So yeah. So like, I want to talk about, you know, adrenochrome and pizza gate, and I want to talk about a uh, false moon landing and all sorts of topics that are basically banned from not just YouTube, but like Amazon and um, even PayPal uh, gets to on certain aspects. I guess I've been floating under the radar a little bit, although it's kind of coming to a head. So I got a, a second strike recently on a very old video about adrenochrome. But the catch is that I never say the word adrenochrome in the entire video. Uh, I don't You're even say, I don't say the word drug. I don't say the word LSD, DMT. Oh, yeah. I censored out all those words. I censored out blood. I censored out um, psychedelic, the word Freemason, Mason, Masonic, just every one of those words that would typically get you a special little warning under your little YouTube video. I censored every one of those videos, uh, one of those words out, not just in the audio, but I also censored it out on the video where I would like blur the word and I guess even that wasn't enough, although it was monetized and it was fully green for the longest time, uh, they hit it. It's like the second that I hit 5,000 followers, they dinged it for spreading hateful and violent speech and conspiracy theories. So lesson learned, even the phrase adrenaline derivative will get you a strike on YouTube. And it was a clip of an actual newscast from Bulgaria. And just for the record, the newscast I do think is BS. I don't think that the Bulgarian news report about a satanic drug called adrenochrome, and they call it like the Satan's narcotic and a whole bunch of other names for it. I don't actually believe that they were like, they actually found some adrenochrome ring where Satanists were, you know, buying and selling adrenochrome. But I think that it's a real substance and I think it's worthy of talking about and even talking about why does it capture the mind and why is it like bring these waves over? I mean, essentially, long story short is because it's modern day blood magic. So it's it's sort of like this secular scientific version of what blood magic used to be seen as this like weird, you know, occult ritual that only cult members do in basements or in the middle of the woods at night. Well, with adrenochrome, it brings that to like the Rockefeller medicine systems. Now we're talking about modern day technology, modern day science, modern medicine, hooking, you know, younger people up and doing blood transfusions to restore youth. All these things are like actual real science now, right? Or it's, it's slowly pointing the needle. And one of those things that's real science is the actual substance of adrenochrome, which is rightfully an adrenaline derivative. But there's a bunch of other adrenaline derivatives uh, obviously, that video was about adrenochrome. So now, was, anyways, just 
hinting about a topic that then in turn talks about adrenochrome is a huge hot button thing. I've been working on a book about yeah, adrenochrome for the last I might have two years on now, own. going on three, worse, to which is a really long time to be working on a book. The biggest thing is that we every time I sort wrong. of uncover a new name, right? I find a new doctor, a new scientist name, my gun and I dig into that person, and I find links to other names and other forms of research. For example, the adrenochrome research completely started as a look into a comic book where I was thinking about what would happen if three or four you know, friends got together and they found adrenochrome for sale on the dark web and they bought you know, a vial of adrenochrome. And that was the very first thought was like, well, does it come in a vial? You know what I mean? Does adrenochrome come in a vial? Could it come in a dime bag? Could it come rolled up into a joint? Could you even smoke it? And if that comes into play, like, I guess, can you inject it? Can you snort it? Like, what are the ways that you can actually ingest adrenochrome? How would they differ? How would you react? And this was, again, was all just talking about how it would work into a comic book story. So I'm, I start doing the research of like, okay, who's actually done adrenochrome on the record and wrote about it? Uh, and I found a couple people, but the only that instance that I found is someone talking about it, using adrenochrome and writing trip reports about it. They also admitted that they were on heroin and meth and they had done LSD recently. So the, re the trip report about adrenochrome in particular seemed a little bit suspect because there was no control. It was just a guy that was doing like every drug known to man and then sort of writing like, oh, OK, on this day, you know, I took a, a little bit of adrenochrome and coke. So it felt like this. And then the next day I did this. And uh, I really wanted to just find a specific research on if you take adrenochrome, what happens? And I found that. And it was it was basically this long series of reports by Dr. Abram Hoffer and another guy named uh, John Smithies. And they did it. They actually found real adrenochrome and they did it they experiment on it they experimented on animals they experimented on their wives on their colleagues they brought it home and they had little like dinner parties where everyone would do adrenochrome and they would all you know basically write down the experiences they had so here and let me let's see what we're gonna do here we're gonna persuade why i'm just gonna say persuade for now because intimidate means we're leaning towards uh, like violence and aggression and brute force, which is where I would normally go or lie. But let's just say persuade. I feel like that would be the bureaucratic thing at first. Like we don't need to lie right off the bat, especially not to say I'm going to hunt somebody down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so anyway, yeah, persuasion use. Bam, we're getting XP That's like nothing. Grandma. Juan's not getting this kind of XP. So, so the uh, the whole research into Adrenochrome, it ends up discovering all these different characters and John Smithies and Dr. Abram Hoffer. And then from there, I start discovering that it's it's an actual psychedelic and the original reports on someone that was completely neutral that hadn't even looked at it as a psychedelic yet discover like, oh, wow, this this does have an immediate effect. And I mean, like immediate. And they also mentioned this substance called adrenalutin, which is sort of a, a cousin of adrenochrome. And that adrenalutin was even harder to test because the effects could last up to two different weeks, like two full weeks. So if you took it today, two weeks later, it would just be starting to wear off. Now, I don't think it would completely take over your reality, but you would be feeling the after effects of it for two weeks. Um, so, so just for that reason alone, they basically decided to to kind of cut it off and to focus specifically on adrenochrome. So that's that's one element of it where all the news reports, right, and all the takedown notices and all the YouTube strikes, they tend to nod that like just mentioning adrenochrome means you're spreading misinformation or that it's like a false conspiracy. When in absolute fact, you can find government funded and Scottish Rite Freemason funded. I'll get to that maybe later. But government funded research that clearly says adrenochrome is a psychedelic. There's also declassified CIA videos where there's a scientist addressing a room full of other CIA agents and other you know, medical and doctors and scientists. But he's telling them they found a compound that was called MER-17, M-E-R-17, and that MER-17 is sort of like a psychedelic antidote so that if someone were to give you LSD or adrenochrome and they mention that the doctor in this MER-17 video mentions by name adrenochrome and says that MER-17 effectively um, like counters the effect and they show a guy, they, they give him LSD and they wait till he's tripping 
and they like talk to him and they interview him and you know he's a little bit whacked out and then they give him some mer 17 and they interview him again and he's like completely sober so they're advertising this compound mer 17 almost like an EpiPen or some other sort of like an antidote so that if you're out in the field and you're suspicious that somebody might have slipped you a psychedelic that you could take this mer 17 compound and it would counteract whatever that psychedelic substances that's causing your your brain to go whack now i got a separate theory on why salvia divinera might counter that and it doesn't work with mer 17 and it might not work with any other psychedelic antidotes the government's come up with but it's for another topic and another show at some point um but the, the other point i was getting is that the, the deeper i go into this right you find out mer 17 you find all these doctors so i start going down these avenues and then it comes up that this exact same research is related to why kids that uh, get diagnosed with ADHD and they get put on Ritalin and that Ritalin legitimately is speed. It's basically meth for kids. Uh, it's like the, the Flintstones chewable version of, of meth and that the whole entire enterprise of juvenile delinquency and trying to counteract juvenile delinquency, it dovetails directly with this adrenochrome research in particular because for, I mean, Think back into like early 1900s, anyone that's done like early American history research, this was sort of the mentality was that if you were a criminal, that there had to be something wrong with you mentally. So therefore, the inverse was true as well. If you were mentally unwell, you were probably a criminal, or at least you were had a high potential of being a criminal, so much to the point that criminals and you know people that were deemed insane would be housed in the exact same places they would both be put into these sanitariums with the ex expectation that there'd be some sort of uh, rehabilitation that you could just like get somebody better so if they're mentally unwell that if you just give them enough focus and they'll start to you know i guess heal from their their mental illness just like if they're actually ill uh, they can get better just like if they're a criminal. It's just like this mental illness for them to discover. And one of the things they were doing, it was taking blood from all of the insane asylum patients. They were taking blood from criminals and they were just looking for patterns, a lot of pattern recognition. And at a certain point, they discovered these high levels of adrenochrome in the blood of schizophrenics in particular. So it opens up this whole avenue of, well, maybe criminals just have some form of like a schizophrenia. So if we can solve schizophrenia, not only can we solve a whole bunch of aspects of crime, but we can also solve this, this weird plague of an issue that let's say you're, you're ultra rich, right? If you notice that one of your progeny, if you're like star kid, um, starts to develop this early onset dementia, also known as dementia precox, that there was almost no way to get them better. It would just be a slow decline. And now when you're supposed to leave all of the inheritance, all the money and power and land and everything to, you know, this, this person that might be crazy before you're even dead. You know what I mean? Before the time you even get to give everything over. So a, it was freaking people out because if they didn't have any sons left and they were getting an older age, there wasn't a lot of other options. You give all your stuff to a mad King and then just like hope for the best, you know what I mean? And destroy your legacy. That was one of the aspects. Um, the other aspect was that they wanted a cure for this because now there's this mental illness where you know people are, will see their progeny starting to get worse and be like, I can throw all the resources at this. I've got doctors and scientists under my thumb. I own all of academia. I own hospitals. Like, What can we do to cure this so that I've got some progeny to give all of my, my things to, you know, my inheritance? So that's, that was why the elite class and all of these different organizations become hyper focused on dementia and dementia precox, which is why there's this huge tie over of the you know quote unquote elites, in particular Scottish Rite Freemasons, and that one is documented. But that's why there's this incredible focus on dementia precox, which then leads to adrenochrome research, which in itself leads into meth and Ritalin and ADHD. Speaking of ADHD, <laughs> <laughs> I was just I, going on a complete rant on my video that was just recently got striked and taken down on Adrenochrome, and we're not streaming to YouTube, so we can, I think, say anything about it. So, man, I think we should just um, stream to YouTube. My goal is to say it so much to the algorithm, it just becomes like water. Like it's just another word that's said so much to chat GPT and on X that all the AI has to accept it as a normal word. 
Well, what's even worse is that when I got my strike, it wasn't even the word adrenochrome. It was that was completely removed in all forms, audio, visual. It was blurred every time I was on the screen. They got a screenshot that said adrenaline derivative. And just having the phrase adrenaline derivative within the context of, I guess, whatever else the AI, you know, the AI was smart enough to know what the video was about. So they found the closest thing that seemed like it was misinformation and gave me that. So it wasn't even the freaking word adrenochrome. It's anything that might hint at adrenochrome, which also is making me think like my cute little code word of thrill oxide that could easily get on found its way to like the little blacklist. You know what I mean? They're figuring it out. I haven't gotten one strike on our episode of adrenochrome called adrenochrome. <laughs> well, and, well, that's the thing too, is I had another video called Adrena homies where we did a round table discussion of adrenochrome and it's actual, you know, biological impacts and how you can like, they actually use it right now. They'll put it in someone's eye to cure issues. Uh, they use it as a blood coagulant, but you know, that video didn't get taken down, but I'm just, I was like, Paranoid as hell, paranoid American, right? <laughs> but I see that strike and they strike me for just hinting at adrenochrome. Meanwhile, I've got a video where we say it like probably over 200 times in the span of an hour or two. So I just took that down to off of YouTube preemptively. I'll put it up on Rumble and everywhere else. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the game we're playing right now. So and and speaking of the game we're playing, I did start a little bit early and I remember we were talking the other day that you said when you played this, you almost do like no gun, which is the opposite of me. So all the stats that I picked were basically like intelligence and stealth and everything. And I, I made an assumption in your absence that no gun also means no fists. Like, does that mean like we can't punch people too? I usually try to do everything. So whether it's this game or Fallout, I try to become such a diplomat and do all their chores for them that no matter what planet I'm on or where I walk in the wasteland, no one pulls their guns on me. And okay. so there are some random marauders and some you know random animals or some people where I'm on their planet and I realize I, there's nothing here. I have everything I want and I don't need to come back here. I might kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> like if it's a bridge I don't need to come back to, they might all be goners. Okay, so it's not straight all gun. It's just very like bureaucratic, diplomatic. So that's yeah. actually what I did. I, I picked bureaucrat and everything else will make us really good at lying and just like persuading. So I feel like that's a good start. So this, I mean, this is the first time I've even been able to kind of like walk around on my own. So we'll, we'll see what we're happening here. I don't even know what I ad agreed to, but. Damn it, my ears! Oh, no. What just happened? Can you hear I don't know if I hurt somebody. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn the audio down a little bit here, too. I so, remember this game. It's been a while. It's been so many years since I played it, but I'm like, oh, yeah, the beginning. You have to come out and, like, they teach you how to use your weapons, kill a couple little rats and shit. <laughs> I, I honestly have no idea what's like why the time dilation is happening automatically. I don't think I'm hitting Q on accident. Maybe that was just to tell me what it was about. We're definitely not at the no gun phase yet. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, at first all the things start coming up as they show you how to use them. And then as the game goes on, they... So uh, we were going to use this time too to just kind of like chill, brainstorm on some like other videos that we can do later on that might take a little bit more prep and research. We can dish a little dirt. Where, where do you want to start? Um, hmm. I do think it's in our, like if we're just going to go right in and spill tea, I do think it's crazy how uh, the conspiracy community has decided to eat itself as opposed to like focus on <laughs> actual conspiracies. So it's like, instead of go after Hillary Clinton, I go after paranoid American. That is wild to me. <laughs> Not wild to me because we're accessible. You know what I mean? Hillary Clinton's never going to respond to your tweet. Um, she's not even going to see your tweet. She's not even going to hear about somebody that saw your tweet to tell her about, you know what I mean? Like it's so far removed. Whereas like we're low hanging fruit. You know what I mean? There's this, this is a really good analogy that I've brought up, uh, 
maybe a few times indirectly, but it's like battle rappers, right? Like once a certain rapper gets in the mainstream and they're making millions of dollars and they can, you know, do sold out shows, there is zero incentive whatsoever to talk to anyone that's kind of under that level, specifically do like a battle rap with them because the only thing that can happen is that either they win and no one's impressed because they're like, well, of course you won. You're the mainstream artist. You know, you've got all these, these uh, records. The only other thing that happens is that they lose. And if they lose now, all of a sudden this battle rapper gets all this clout and they, they literally go down and rank a little bit. Cause then the next time someone brings them up, it's like, Oh yeah, but did you hear he lost to some, you know, internet battle rapper on SoundCloud? And they're like, Oh wow, that's whack. You know? And it, and it just like loses a little credibility. So all the smart battle rappers, they knew right off the bat, like, Oh, just don't battle rap anyone that's like under your, your weight class essentially. So that's kind of what's happening, right? Like we get, you get picked out in your weight class, just like this is some freaking, you know, like weird prize battle, but there's no damn prize at the end of it. It's just uh, being angry. It is kind of a punching up and punching down thing because if I harass Hillary Clinton every day on Instagram, which I do, she doesn't make one comment that you don't (laughs) find Cheney in Wonderland under. So if I harass her every single day, but one day she writes back to me and punches down all the amount of loosh that I just got from Hillary is everything. If I can go after Madonna every day and then one day Madonna's like, Fuck you, Project Cheney. I just, it's so worth it to just keep. And so sometimes I feel like in the realm of um, the podcast world now, you don't even have to have any content. You just have to get somebody with content to say your name. We'll see him back to it. And that's it. So I, it's like if certain people just keep coming at Project Cheney, I'm going to talk about Cheney, stupid dyke, this, that, and the other thing. Oh, look at, she's a fake feminist. Oh, she likes Trump. Whatever the things they keep attacking, (laughs) they mean nothing until I utter their name. And then everybody, like I've just gave them my wand over their shoulders of magic. So I don't acknowledge or observe them so much like I don't give them the kudos or the clout or the um energy they seek (laughs) where does the where does the fake feminist argument come from like what what standpoint and what perception where where that comes from I think because I'm a lesbian so it's the first thing that they want to attack me with that they say I'm a feminist and I'm like wrapping it in all this patriotism like they can't handle the fact that I actually love American men. And so, and I, I love dudes that like take care of their family and that provide things and protect things and dudes can't handle that. So when I big up those kind of dudes, it hits them right in their ego and they tell me I am a feminist <laughs> <laughs> or, and I even say things like no men should play sports with females. There shouldn't be any trans agenda because if females could ever play sports with men, they would have never been a female sport. We would be playing with men right now. <laughs> and then like, how is that? But so it's, it's, it's more of like uh, they have an expectation that you fail to meet once they actually start talking to you. And then they're angry that they were wrong about their assumption. And that's where I guess the fake feminist comes from, where it's like you never present as such. It's just their assumption and they get mad about it. Well, they're more telling me I am a feminist right now. <laughs> and that I'm burying it in conspiracy so that I'm going to lead all these women astray. And then at the end of it, they're going to have a pink pussy at. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a feminist in, in any definition of that word? No, I'll light bookstores on fire. I'll write, I'll light lesbian bookstores on fire. <laughs> <laughs> in Minecraft, in Minecraft. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't even understand the point of feminism. I don't, uh, to me, feminism was entirely a Rockefeller a uh, ploy to get women out of the house so they could tax the entirety of the, they just wanted to tax the slaves. That's all feminism was. It's um, how are we going to get all these adults out of the house so we can tax them? And if we get these women to do three times the amount of work for a little less money for just maybe a year or two, and then we show them this for the next 30 years, they're going to constantly think they get paid less. So they're going to even work harder when anyone who actually had a business, if I ran a multi-million dollar company and women really got paid 75 cents to a dollar that a man got paid, everybody in my office would be women. 
<laughs> like it's such a stupid idea. Like, no, the way we would save money would be to hire only women. And um, so really they just wanted to tax both the workers and then get the kids indoctrinated into the school system even earlier. So I think feminism is all. A and and to, to tag on to this, and this one's come up at, at my, uh, when I went, when I went home, when I was a lot earlier, like right out of college, this was one of the conspiracy theories that I brought to the table that I was talking to my parents about. And I think my mom was like offended a little bit when I mentioned that I thought the feminist movement was really to drive down uh, the price of labor so that you, now you had people competing for the exact same jobs and you had a need for like more services to be filled because you're no longer in the house. And it was one of those like, you don't really believe that do you like I'm, <laughs> I'm like like i've heard you say it and if it's you know if it's like a, a shock value thing that's one but do you really believe that and it was a weird moment because i was like yeah i think i really do believe that I, I guess is that like a huge milestone turning point if you legitimately believe that the feminist movement in itself was really meant to break up the family unit at like a governmental, like, you know, corporate level. I, I do. I do think that. And it was 100% like, do too. And the weird one for me is that this didn't come from like an Andrew Tate, like pro man, you know, like men's right, save the foreskin movement. It had nothing to do with any of that. It was because I was assigned a book to read. Um, and I can't even remember her name. It was Catherine something or other, but she was like the wife of some guy that owned like a new, like the Washington post or the Washington something or other. And she gets like really huge, um, in like, as like a, a published author. And the project was like, you know, read this book and write about how you think that this person became successful against all odds. That was kind of like the, you know, against all odds print, uh, like a, a pauper to Prince kind of story rags the riches and i look into it and the very first thing i do before i even uh or actually after i finish reading the book i look up her name and i find all these articles that like she was married to someone that was uh at like the head of the cia and all these intelligence operations so the book report i turn in was like oh well, she's influential and she overcame all odds because of the cia and it that was my first experience in that you know the school didn't necessarily want to hear that explanation they wanted to hear the one that they told me they wanted to hear. Uh, but that was my entry point into like the feminist movement because this lady was, he, it was um, uh, Gloria Estefan or is that a singer? That's a singer. That's a Miami what, what song. Am I thinking? Which one am I thinking of? Turn the beat around. <laughs> turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. <laughs> no, no hate to Gloria Estefan. There is, there's a, I can't pull the name up by the top of my head because I'm playing a game and and breathing at the same time but, but like Gloria one of the Steinem. main there you go there you go Gloria Steinem that she also had all these intelligence and like uh government connections and for those reasons I was like man this is really fishy that out of all the people that's like counterculture and it's gonna like take down the system it's gonna be someone that's in bed with like literally in bed with the system and started in the system I also, um, for me, I knew the feminist movement wasn't real because I, one of the blackest things and like one of the biggest traumas growing up is that China used to kill its daughters. I just remember this growing up the whole time about like, oh, they can have one kid. And so they only want boys. Well, what happens if they have a girl? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and so however many millions of daughters are born and they just do away with these girls, I feel like at the same time, they kind of gave us this fake feminism in America, this fake idea of like make heads roll. And, you know, we even get this like Gloria Steinem, like you're saying, I think it's Albright is the other one of those ladies. You got Hillary Clinton coming up like the rungs at the time. So I now that, there's a feminist for you, Hillary Clinton. It's almost like that whole entire plot was to get here now so that we could have Beyonce with who runs the world and Lady Gaga and these witch hunts and Hillary and Pelosi and AOC. And it's just like this menage of females to just be like a really negative feminine, like a really... Uh, bad idea of what feminine is in general like the pants suits and the i don't know like none of them seem like they were good mothers 
<laughs> have, you ever, have you ever tried the pantsuit look at any point in your life? Even I have such a weird thing. Like if I put on a full dress, I feel so queer. And if I put on a tuxedo, I feel so queer. Like I have this in between where I'm like, oh, it doesn't feel right. And so I have a lot of jackets that I'll wear and they're all dude jackets. I don't have any pants that match the jacket. <laughs> Like, I don't ever go full Hillary. <laughs> it would be so ridiculous. It would it would be a very interesting trajectory for you. But we, we also, we started talking about this, about like you getting accused of fake feminism because it was like this weird form of like, maybe punching lateral almost. Like it's not even necessarily punching up or down. It's like a lateral punch right but it's the the intent is to get some kind of momentum or loose to like get you moving because i feel like what happens is people run out of ideas or steam or they hit a creative block and instead of looking within they start looking you know for the outside like they want they want to be like a some kind of a catalyst and they feel like oh if i can cause somebody else that's making interesting content and like loose them or just cause them to do something maybe that'll spawn like some new idea in me and one of these uh one of these that i found out recently and i guess here, here's the, the the crux of some of the the tea dishing actually there's a lot more but so so this this one guy he's like a an ex oto member that just chain smokes nonstop. uh shout out to all my smokers not a problem but uh, he starts calling me out as like a Masonic pig and making little like memes with a, like a pig in a trough with a little Disney hat on. Like the, the idea behind them wasn't bad. The execution was like a four out of 10. The concepts were, I don't know, five out of, I'm being generous, five out of 10. Uh, but it was the, the thing that annoyed me the most was how passive aggressive it would be because it would never be by name. It would always just be these little tiny like tidbits that only I guess me and, and people close to me would, would put the things together. So it felt like such a indirect yet specific thing. So I just started calling them out, like tagging them like, hey, is it me? It's me you're looking for. You know what I mean? Like that was <laughs> me the whole time. Uh, and I had some extra time. I'm I driving back from the convention. We'll talk about that. But I'm driving back to the convention. It's like a four hour car ride, especially with that Disney traffic. Once you hit like central Florida. So I start just going through and I see another one of the damn posts with, you know, me as a pig with a little Mickey hat on, uh, along with a little advertisement for this new website. And the website was called the occult research Institute. Do not, go there give them traffic but that was the name of it it's the site called occult research institute and they were they were basically being advertised as like here's the place you go that's away from the grifters that want your money if anyone's got a patreon or if they accept donations or if they uh, god forbid you sell something you know you are immediately in this camp of like and it, it feels like a like a communist purity test but anyways this is the 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 feel. So I go to the website and I start clicking around. This was created by a, this is a Q creation, by the way, that we'll go into. Keep going, but really, I, okay. I, I this is all part that. of the Q creation that they don't even realize when the mainstream black pillars are leaning into so much of their rhetoric, their phrasing, their everything. The grifter of it all is patriot. It's P A Y. T R I O T. <laughs> it's Patriot. It was started in the Q movement because it was be careful who you follow. And it was talking about big, huge accounts that were being fake Christians, that were generals, okay. maybe, that were, um, uh, what's that? Lynn Wood, an attorney that used to be a John Bonet attorney that just came out of the woodwork all of a sudden and leaned all into Trump. Um, it was talking about be careful who you follow and be careful who maybe like Mike Lindell, the My Pello guy who all of a sudden has this huge account and he's making all this money off of it. And it's like, those are patriots. Don't let anyone use your patriotism to make money. So a lot of the people in the Anon movement, when we were all anonymous, we didn't make money off Q truce. That was the goal. If we were opening up people to our uh, country being stolen, you weren't allowed to make money off Donald Trump. You weren't allowed to make money off Q. You weren't allowed to make money off that. That was what it was to be a grifter. Over the years, since 2018, it's crept in that this 
hierarchy of truth tellers feels that about all truth. So if you put a dollar on it, then you are keeping the truth from somebody. What they don't get from it is it's not the truth that you're talking about. You're actually selling merch or a product or an edited video or they've lost because they were just taking information that was already given to them and trying to make money off of it. You're making your own shit. This is where the these guys that are, they thought they were such magic workers that they were just going to pick up a microphone and everyone wanted to hear them speak, even though none of their friends or family are around to hear them speak. They don't hardly have any friends or family. And they're, but everyone was so taken with their ideas. They were going to get on a microphone and the world wanted to listen. And 16 people show up and all of a sudden people want to hear you or me and we're a patriot. So that's what I think that they're not even realizing these words are all from Q, but then they'll talk about, oh, Q is so dumb. Dude, if you learned how to read the maps back when and never got so mad, you wouldn't still be dissecting something now that you're actually taking part in. (laughs) That's actually fascinating to me because... In a way, right? The same reason that people were like hating on Mike Lindell, that's the same loose energy moving around. And it turns into like a witch hunt where like everyone might be Mike Lindell. Everyone might be trying to sell me a pillow at the end of this, you know, documentary. Uh, yep. I don't know. Part of me is like, God forbid someone tries to sell you a <laughs> fucking pillow, especially if they spent, you know, I don't know, two or three weeks on like some kind of content and doing the research and editing. God forbid they try and sell you a pill at the end of it. Now, I know Mike Liddell doesn't do that part. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if he... It would be kind of dope if Mike Liddell put out like 9-11 documentaries. I think I would legit buy a pillow. And I guess... He actually did put out a whole bunch of documentaries on how the election was stolen in Arizona. Well, so that so that one was... I mean, but that's grifter stuff, right? He was just doing that for grifting. <laughs> yeah. Who cares about a stolen election? <laughs> Uh, voting doesn't well, matter. Especially if it comes from some <laughs> crackhead pillow salesman. Yeah, that loves his country. The, the, <laughs> the tail end of that rant, though, right, is that here's here's someone that's criticizing and saying, like, how dare you sell things and make money off of conspiracy theories, which, by the way, is is where my heart is. Like, that's where I started. I didn't, like, start in the conspiracy realm. I'm like, how can I make money? I sat down and was like, I want to make comic books for sale and games for sale and merch for sale about conspiracy theories in the freaking late nineties. I'm, I'm wanting to do this. Right. So I guess that makes me a hips, like a hipster conspiracy grifter in some way, which I'll take that. But I go to this occult research Institute site. This is supposed to be the free beacon of truth that you go here instead of going to any other website that's going to try and sell you some crap at the end of it this place is not going to sell you anything it's just going to be pure you know occult truth by a true insider a team of insiders even they've got a whole like who are we page and all the people related and i just want to be very clear that i don't inherently think that everyone related or listed on the occult research institute website is necessarily in on some grift or anything i think if anything the, the person running the site uh, which I think is the occult reject guy, the o- the OTO chain smoker dude. I think that's his site, but whoever's running the site, they've kind of swindled all these other people in to get like a credibility, right? Like here's all the people that uh, are on our team. This is the, the appeal to authority sort of uh, logical fallacy, but I'm going through the website and I've been messing with AI for years. Like 2019, I think I started in AI, like, I was generating uh, memes before it was cool to generate memes in AI. But in, during all this time, right, I've been able to identify visual things. Like I can tell when something's AI a little bit quicker. Now, I'm not like a perfect eagle eye, but I can tell the artifacts if the fingers and everything else is perfect. There's like a certain face and I, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like seeing someone with downs, not in a derogatory a way. But like, this is it's a huge training. You teach your eyes how to see the uncanny valley. And once correct. you work with AI enough, you start to notice it instantly because nothing is equal on both sides. You start to the nuance of what makes us human is that our, our imperfections and you start seeing it's so quickly once you play with AI enough. Right, well, and, and it's specifically when there's perfection juxtaposed with imperfection, 
Um, so like, so anyways, I'm, I'm going through the occult research Institute site and I'm clicking on a few pages and I'm starting to get that feel like, and, and I am the opposite of an AI witch hunt person. In fact, I actively, um, go after like threads where someone's being accused of like, this looks like AI artwork. Like, I love those. That's going to be my favorite new witch hunt in the art world outside of the conspiracy world. I've got like my own reputation in the art world. Cause I am like. Uh, pro AI art and music and ev- like everything. I'm pro AI, but I can also recognize when someone's just like lazily, like just like half assing AI because then it has all those like default templates, right? It was, it's almost like this might be a really bad and dated analogy, but you see someone doing a presentation and they use like that default word art from MS Word in like 2001 with like the bubbles and the blue bevel and stuff. And you're just like, I know where you got that. That was the very first one you could have clicked on. And that's why all your slides have that stupid orange gradient because it was just the default thing, right? And that was okay for a little while until the bar raised and it kept raising and raising. And now people have got these keynote presentations and they get their own because you can do that now with low effort. So I I find this website and I click on the tarot page and I swear to you, there's this one phrase that AI says more often than anything else, especially chat GBT. But it'll say crap like this intricate woven tapestry of experiences or the tapestry of cultures comes together. And like that one that one phrase of tapestry, for whatever reason, whoever trained chat GPT the first time around, like it freaking sunk its tease into that, <laughs> that tapestry word. And it loves. So on the tarot page of this this fake website. Uh, it says that like twice in a row, literally one sentence says like the intricate tapestry of something. And the next sentence is like, and in this tapestry of occult information. So I'm like, this sounds like AI. And I know that the AI detectors are not foolproof, uh, even teachers that use them and like try and prove. But I took that copy and I put it into every AI text detector I could find. And they all rated it 100% AI generated. Like not a single word of it was even you know, like crafted or, or massaged in, which makes sense because if you wrote something and you saw that you were use the word tapestry twice in a row, one sentence in the next, most people, even a dumb person would be like, Oh, let me, let me cover my tracks here. Right. So I was like insulted when I see like they didn't even cover their tracks on how sloppy of a job they did on using just pure AIs. It, they, it seemed that they literally went to chat GPT and said, I'm making a website about the tarot. What should I put? And it just goes, blah, 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 blah. and they just copied and pasted it, saved, published, walked away. Didn't even read what they had generated in the AI. So anyways, this is the level that the occult rejects are coming after me and uh, trying to, to say that, you know, I'm grifting because I make action figures about adrenochrome. They're mad, mad about that, but then they'll go on the chat GPT and copy and paste some crap and then spread it around like this is going to be the answer. Here, here's the answer to all the grifting is some idiot that plugs in a chat GPT, a, a Google owned uh, you know property and just spits out what Google told them to spit out. And I, I made this comment that I would prefer misinformation like misinformation means somebody sat down like it's a TV show, right? Like th- like there was a script writer and there was an editor and there was someone that proofread it and like all these things like I would rather have that amount of loose energy coming my way than some low effort crap that just gets shot out by the end of chat GPT that it's an insult to anyone that comes across that site. And this is the mentality of the person putting it together is like, Oh, any idiot that comes to anything that I run has got to be a moron. So I don't even have to proofread this. So ran, yeah, ran, like oh, you could just go here. to chat GBD and ask any of the questions that you have. There's no need to click on this website. Right, that's <laughs> that is literally what they're saying. But for anyone that doesn't know, cause they're fairly popular. They got like, I don't know, like 30 to 50,000 subscribers across different channels. So there are guarantee there's going to be people going to the site and signing up. And funny enough, they do sell crap. Uh, it's just not like the site itself. But if you click on any of the people, like they're all doing tarot readings for 50 bucks an hour and they've all got Patreon pages. So like, I just wonder like what part, like where's the line? Like if you, if you drew it out on a map, right? Like here I am over here selling a drink. Like with your macro. tarot cards and you're like, you have tarot and then this guy down there selling adrenochrome comics. And then I'm over here with a ball under three cups on the street. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. That's the full spectrum, right? So somewhere <laughs> in between the middle and where I'm at, there's like a line that you're not supposed to cross. Uh, so I don't know. I'm going to, I'll keep trying to find that line, that's, but I think it's funny too, because people do the same shit with spirituality where it's like, you know, you, if you look far enough back in a lot of these, the people selling you some kind of spiritual something, you can see the beginning of their journey. And then all of a sudden, like somewhere in year three, they're asking you for $150 to pull tarot cards that if you pull back to year one of their show, they had no idea what they were talking about, but now they're spiritually touched. But then they'll tell you somebody else is totally like, raking you over the coals spiritually because they have a ball under a cup on the streets and they're talking to you in fast Jamaican. You know, it's like there literally is no difference. If I wanted to say, um, if good stuff's going to happen to you, I put it on this ball and I'm putting it under these shells. And if you can pick the right ball, that's the good thing that's going to happen to you. And if you say accept that and I accept that, there's no difference of that in tarot. So there's these certain things that in the realm that... Um, they're becoming the hierarchy of spirituality and the hierarchy of conspiracy and the hierarchy like, oh, we're the rejects of the occult. We're the ones that are rejected from the occult. We're going to tell you all the things the occult uses by using all the books and research that the occult lets us find. But we found the right stuff. Well, like, and, I just, and to be fair. They weren't rejected from the occult or the person. I, it's just one person that I know of, but he wasn't rejected from the occult. He just left the occult. But I guess like the occult leavers or like the occult giver uppers or the occult, I don't know, like fizzle outers doesn't have the same ring as like the occult reject. I'm, I'm the, in the occult, you know, revolutionary. Like it, it makes it feel like he had these ideas that were so you know controversial and so like flipping everything over that they were like whoa dude you're you're too deep for us you need to leave the oto because or like that was not exactly what happened right it was just like wasn't moving up quick enough maybe found out that you know there wasn't as much sex rituals as that you would think going into it. It was like, oh, you just sign up for this. And once you get to the eighth degree, it's just like free sex all where the time. All the you just show up. Yeah, where's all? It's just a bunch <laughs> of dudes chain smoking. <laughs> what, yeah. where, what's going on here? I could just go to the AA meeting for free and get good coffee <laughs> at least. <laughs> like there's so much of this too, where it's like um, everybody, if you were in a cult, if you were a cult follower, I don't understand why right away everybody would take your word that now you got your shit together. In my opinion, I'm like, I, when I hear these people that they like, oh, let me tell you all the ins and outs out of the, the cult because I got out of the occult two years ago. No offense. Your words don't have that much weight. You're going to fall in line with the next cult you find and the next cult you find and the next cult you find. Like, it's just like you're... Um, you're, you can't wait to jump on the next thing. It's your, your, you were born into narcissism because a cult leader is an obvious narcissist, but nobody says how narcissistic the cult followers are. So in a cult, we're all the chosen ones with the information. We're all the ones. Don't you see if you follow me that you're also chosen? So your narcissist is like, yes, we know all the answers. So deep down, you're still that same narcissist in there. No, is if this victim blaming? Is I, it victim blaming the cult cult members narcissists? Um, I think a uh, trauma does make people narcissists. So no, and I think there might <laughs> there's too many victims in the world in general. Like everybody wants to hold their victim title. It's why 9-11 got away with it because everyone had to know. So I knew someone that was almost there on 9-11. It's the same way COVID lasted so long and why people that you know, probably that were rejected from cults and have podcasts, literally swab their nose just because they were so fucking excited to tell somebody they knew they had COVID. When people tell me I had COVID, I always say, how do you know? I just want their brain to think about that for a second. I've never stuck a swab up my nose for anyone to tell me anything. You know what's their scary though? You, you, so excited to have the COVID because that was braver to get through than just the cold. 
great. You say that, but what's scary is that I feel like that what you're describing is a gap in the market now. So so now there will be people out in public. There you see them at Publix, right? You're standing next to them and they've got the mask on and they're getting the sub made and they look at you and they're like, "Have you been vaccinated?" Let's just assume that they they have the gall to say that, right? And you're like, "Well, I'm not telling you." Imagine a product where you could pull it out and just like scan someone remotely and be able to tell whether or not they've got COVID. So if they're like, well, I'm not getting tested. It's like, well, I'll test you right now. Beep. And now it's like, I've got your picture, you know, I'll do it with my, my app. Right. So now I've got your picture. I've got your temperature. Like this person has COVID. Like you're describing something that, that will probably us. happen. Remember all of our iPhones? Like this happened in 2020 or 2021. All of our iPhones, like they tried to make it so that we had to check in and they wanted us to put our card on there so we could travel. Yeah, the the digital passports. Yeah, they, they've already tried to do this. And um, us to, uh, if there was a COVID outbreak, it was automatically going to tell us on our phones in our area, like the emergency Amber alerts and the presidential alerts, they were all attached in now. So they were going to be like, FYI, there's an outbreak in your area, but people had to turn it off on their iPhone. It was like one of those big things that everyone was like, did you know our iPhone's about to track COVID? That's right. <laughs> it, it would be like a tracing thing. So you could figure out everyone that you would come in contact with and and I'm sure that's all they were using it for. It was definitely not for anything other than, you know, just health anonymous. Yeah, health it was just a fake virus they were using it for. It had nothing to do with anything else. Um, but here's the other thing, too, that I don't mind. And this is because I think uh, being a closeted gay person for a length of my life, you carry the scarlet letter around once you come Wait, out. you're gay? <laughs> And if you, once you come out of the closet and you carry this lie for so long, you refuse to ever lie to anyone. It's like, oh, it was such a burden for so many decades that it's like to, you won't lie about simple things anymore. Like I'm not going to play along with COVID-19, even if everyone makes you a pariah. And so there's these scarlet letters, I think that we carry in life. And I don't care if half my audience disagrees with me, I don't care if 99% of them disagree with me. I don't care if some other person that thinks they're a content provider or thinks they're bigger than me wants to plague down on me and have all their followers come to my page. I keep up all their comments. Like I don't care. There isn't any amount of all I've been doxxed by the Miami Antifa. There isn't any amount of anything at this point online online tippy tap typing at me man you're a grown man you're tippy tap typing at me i have literally zero fear it like you might as well be a canadian telling me something <laughs> like it has zero weight in my reality um, there was a really good one i care it was like some rapper but someone was like i'm being you know like a like harassed and attacked online and someone was like like close the window <laughs> like that's the, yeah. that's the end of it look like don't look at the screen T turn your head 90 degrees and the harassment stops immediately it's just the the amount of uh i don't give a shit if i don't agree or i will always get my people's back i'm a ride or die and it, you can look back to however i don't care who people have tried to come in on if they're my homies I got their back. And so any of this silly shit that when people try to play online, the real ones, it might take 360 days. It might take 700. You can look back to my oldest shows. I stand where I always said I stood. I say what I always said I say. All these motherfuckers flip flop back and forth. I've watched them all cowardly. I go into their chat rooms where they're like trying so hard to, I just want to keep my audience happy because my audience keeps my lights on. My audience never kept my lights on. My audience never pay my bills. So I love my audience. I'm there for them. Some of them are my dear friends. Some of them like energetically heal me and I love them, but they don't dictate my authenticity. And so many of these other content providers, they're reliant on their audience to pay their bills. So they have to be a fake Christian today, or they have to be love and light, or they have to sell you a black pill. Because if you don't, if you don't think the end is coming, then they can't sell you the fix. So they've become their own big pharma. It's their spiritual big pharma, their conspiracy big pharma. But I don't think any information I have in here is some kind of information you can't get somewhere else. They all think, oh, 
I'm the machine. Like I, God has come through me and I am this new special thing. And I'm going to point out the dangers of paranoid Americans, Hillary Clinton Legos. Thank God I'm here. <laughs> like it's just so retarded and I'm going to call it out. I, I, I have no fear of calling it out. I don't have any, you want to make an enemy of me? Cool. Have fun. Because I don't really, it's like you, you're going to be throwing like pebbles at a window that I don't even notice. It's like, If how there could be crows that hate me and every day they could drop a date in my yard to show me they hate me. I literally don't notice. I have date trees in my yard. You know, that's how I feel sometimes about the energy that people are throwing out. Like, yeah, you might be throwing pebbles in my pond, but there's a waterfall that hits that same spot. And I don't even notice the pebbles you're trying to like evoke of energy. What do you think about like the louche aspect, right? So someone starts trolling you online and you actually respond to it. You know, you, you post a link, you just post the reply. Did you lose? Like, is that immediate loss that, you know, you've, you've now given some kind of energy into the universe? No, I comment at Hillary. <laughs> I feel like as long as you're the observer of it and not participating, if you can laugh, this is where I think um, salt is a very, it has to be in your spell. Salt has to be in any spell. And so for your spell to be very powerful, you have to have tears. And those are either tears that come from a place of like sorrow and sadness, or they come from a place of hilarity. You laugh so hard at whatever it is you did or your friends did or the meme you just made that tears rolled out of your face. If you can make yourself laugh that hard at whatever the response is, then you live in that person's brain. It's like a tennis match back and forth that really, if I never think about you, but I live in your brain, then you're observing my magic constantly. It makes me a more powerful wizard every second of the day. And that's how I feel about anyone. If somebody tries to give me a bad day, I'm like, is this cunt a more powerful witch than me? No, 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 no. (laughs) I have to like reverse it because I just think it's only carry this energy. Are there any cunts that are better witches than you? Um, and there's Hillary, some is Hillary Clinton, the better witch. There's some cunts that have such good specific magic. Like I can't, I don't try to control the weather that well. Sometimes I get ahead of myself and I'm like, Oh, did I make a tornado on accident? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm not, I don't know anything about cards. I'm trying to get into the Medici. I've always wanted to use playing cards, but like the universe doesn't no. speak to me in tarot or runes or stones or anything like that. Or, um, but like my mom's a powerful witch. She's like a Jesus witch. She's Christian, but she, whatever she believes, she believes like a mustard seed. She never needs to educate herself on whatever her belief is. It just is like whatever the feeling is inside her. She doesn't need to pick up 10 books to validate it to herself. So it's like, mom, you cannot go on this trip to Europe. There's a hurricane coming. You cannot do that. And she's like, Cheney, I anointed my house with oil today. Everything's going to be fine. And there'll be like a hurricane coming <laughs> dead on for us. All the news. Everyone's like, this is the end. And my mom's on her plane. It goes off. It never hits. No hurricane ever happens. But it's just like she believes that stuff. Like she visited me in the hospital when I had surgery and I was on death's door. She's like, oh, I knew you were going to be fine the second you got out of surgery because the story didn't dictate that you almost die and then die. It was the whole story is you almost die and then thrive. Like it didn't, the fairy tale that she already saw in her head, once I got out of surgery, everything else was just, it didn't matter the cancer or the chemo or the whatever. She's just like, oh, it's fine. That's just part of the journey. Like it's just in her head, her mustard seed of her 12 year old belief, that is the most powerful witch. But that's, that is some OG magic too. I don't, this is going to be like oversimplistic, like too simplistic to be like the absolute truth. But I was reading this uh, article recently that was making a really good point. It was about Mormonism and it was about how like people, this is going to sound like a weird segue, but how people uh, make all these funny jokes like, haha, magic underpants and haha, Mormons believe in all this like silly stuff. And the article was making a point that will actually, you know, like a key, uh, AKS, like actually uh, up until the late 1800s, 
most rural people just out in the country and living on farms and everything, they weren't necessarily like Christian the way that a lot of people say Christian now. Like they, they did a lot of folk magic. There was a lot of language of the birds and like, like true magical talismans and folklore and all this. And what really changed that were these like revival um, camps where they would set up a big tent in the middle of town and people would be like, Oh, what's going on over there? And, you know, generate some interest and they'd go over there and they would see in the, these big revival Christian tents, they'd be doing a lot of like miracle work, a lot of magic. And it would basically tell them in a, in a very like subconscious subtle way, Hey, you know, all that folk magic that you brought over from whatever your country, your parents and your grandparents culture was, that's actually Christianity. And now if, if you just join this church, you can keep doing your folk magic and get a Christian pass so that you don't have to feel like you've been excluded from this new wave of religion that founded this country. So almost like over the course of not even a, a few decades, right? All of this folk magic and like, you know, folklore and, and not necessarily Christian backgrounds gets adopted. And which is what Christianity is great at doing. They're great at saying like, you know what? We were really hard on this, but we're going to open up a little bit. You know, you're gay. You know what? You can be a priest now. And they, they can constantly do that. And the Mormon church just does that, but like a hundred times faster because they're a little bit smaller and they don't have all the same overhead as the, the Catholic church has. You know what I mean? So, but they both operate in the same, but the, the point being is that even like what you would consider a hardcore Christian Bible thumper, if you just threw a rock at a room full of Bible thumpers, you'd hit someone and they would probably have some sort of folk magic incorporated in their acceptable amounts of beliefs. You know, one, one of these ones that came up when I was talking to a Mormon was uh, and, uh, Heidi Love. Shout out Heidi Love. Got an awesome uh, Mormon channel. But she said that before meals sometimes they would use like a divining rod or they would use a pendulum and the pendulum would literally tell you whether you should start with the, the mashed potatoes first or the broccoli first. But what it was is a remnant of what people used to use that folk magic to make all their decisions, even down to the most trivial thing, like which side should we start with for dinner tonight? My, it's a weird thing that the ladies in my family on my father's side they gave, um, it was always two cents, like have, you know, make sure you have your two cents, but they, if they ever gave a wallet, a purse or something, it always had two cents in it. My dad always carried a coin and it was always a big thing. I carry one coin. I have one silver coin in my pocket all the time or in my wallet. Do you know what this is from? What? I'm, I'm just curious. Do you know what like the two cents is? Why not three uh -uh. cents? Why not 10 cents? Uh, it was just like, you know, here's your two cents, almost like it's your like you give that, um, you know, or someone's like, let me just give my two cents here, I, you from, know, like from the peanut gallery. <laughs> yeah, almost that, too. But my dad with the coin, there was something about flipping the coin, but he never checked it. It was you always knew your answer when the coin was in the air. And so the you never check it. You just flip it in in the flip in the cover you already know the answer you're supposed to make. And um, I always just thought that was such like, uh, when you look at coins and you were saying birds, like the auguries, people would read auguries in these old uh, tents. They would have the snakes in the revival tents all the time, which is such not a Christianity thing. If this snake bites you, then this means that you're, <laughs> but this is something that they would do in these tents. And it's weird when you said it, it just is like, oh, this is where Elvis came from. Like Elvis came up through these tents. He was huge. Um, before he went pop, he, the reason he learned he, he hung out with black people and came up through these Christian revival psyop tents that went through the black South and the poor communities to probably what you're saying, get the hoodoo, the voodoo, the witchcraft, the old native magics all out of there. But it's curious that you have um, this huge pop culture thing. And maybe in America, if we say whatever magics that might exist in a land and some people theorize that, um, 
you know, Elvis is Donald Trump in that funny way. But what about if it's an energy <laughs> that has to stay in America that keeps America, America, that it has nothing to do with an Elvis or Donald Trump, but in that midsummer or in that hereditary way, there is an energy and the evil day is spreading it with the Queens and Jubilee, but something about a Mircea, a Morica, um, there used to be this Elvis character. And the only time they ever got him off soil was to move him over to Germany. And that's when they did the British invasion. And so then they have the Beatles come in and then that's when everything changes in our whole zeitgeist, like almost like it's the flip. And then Elvis comes back and he can't leave soil ever again, but they trap him in Las Vegas. <laughs> you're, you're starting to make me get a little bit crazy here. Cause I'm thinking like Elvis might have been another one of those things, just like the, the folk revivals, right? It brings these people that don't connect themselves to Christianity so much. And it's like, no, no, you're, you're part of it. Look, we're doing all the same things you do. So now it's like Elvis is doing that, but now he's bridging, like you said, like the voodoo aspect of like black culture. And it's like, no, no, you guys think that this is all off limits. It's actually acceptable. Don't worry. Watch. We'll usher in this new wave of acceptance where now, you know, all of like the, the, the dancing, which when you mentioned Elvis and voodoo, now I think of him doing like the hip shake and all that, like that looks like the same sort of dances you'd see from like a Petwa ritual, you know, and they're like drinking liquor and like breathing fire and doing like crazy dancing. And then what happens after Elvis makes that acceptable, then they bring in the Beatles that come in and say, no, no, we're bigger than Jesus. It's almost like a, like an atheistic agnostic, I would say satanic, like in in the non-religious sense, but like an, a me, me, me satanic sense, right? So that is like a complete 180 to what Elvis was sort of representing, which was more of like, um, you know, acclamation aspect. Hey, it is so crazy. His clothes, his... Um regulator his clothes all all through it like we see him he dyes his hair so he gets this like black hair and then the tv if this is a different magic so medea hollywood if it's competing magics if it's merlin versus madam mim let's say then they can't have this hoodoo voodoo snake be shown on their black mirror and so when he comes on the black mirror and does all this is he breaking a spell that that nightly TV was, or is he playing into it? Does that become the sexual twist that starts all of this, that now we're at the trans agenda? Like it's or, his, the thing. Or, <laughs> and this the, uh, lie. That, <laughs> if, if there's anybody at all that's theoretically in the position to say, like control what Elvis is doing and control what the, the Beatles are doing, right? If, if you can move both of those chess pieces because mm -hmm. you're playing a game against yourself, that essentially gives you control over that Hegelian dialectic where you get to do the, the thesis and the antithesis to make the synthesis. So if like, you know what your end goal is, it's like, okay, well, I'll bring in this Christian revival aspect and I'll bring in this satanic atheist agnostic aspect and through the two of those the conflict will arise and i can kind of steer it by deciding if i move my rook up here or if i move my rook up on this side you know it's like it, it's not a direct formula of like a plus b equals c it's more of like this long chess game well here's the other thing what if elvis was the and he was supposed to write all this music and be all this kind of vibe and then the only way they can trap him is not only does he get back and have to stay in Las Vegas forever, he gets tied into Hollywood by the Colonel. And then every single bit of song that ever comes out of his mouth afterwards becomes trash because he just has to sing what was written for him for the movie. So he's not even allowed to Michael Jackson or use his musing that what she, maybe he was here for to inspire something like, let's say musing is a huge, super powerful magic. And that's why a record company would want to own your master. If you were a muse, like that would be the perfect way for me to gather your magic is slowly own all your masters. So for Elvis, and then you have Lisa Marie and all his masters go to Michael Jackson. And then the cheapest way that Michael gets those is the smartest business arrangement that then you can never have Lisa Murray go to trial. He marries her. Then she can give me that stuff for next to nothing. And the government has nothing to do with it. 
It's so brilliant. And Paul, supposedly Paul, is the one who told Michael Jackson to start doing this and buying up all the masters. And the first ones he bought up, the Beatles. I don't Do know. Do you have any particular uh, opinion on like Paris Jackson and then all the speculation that uh, she's, she's like completely unrelated? Mm. I think Debbie, her mom, she was like a nurse or something or a caretaker at his plastic surgeon. So we know. So we, but apparently she's the womb for all his kids. And she is, I can't believe that he would use just a random woman to be the womb for all of his kids. She would have to be very chosen. And Paris Jackson has her name because Michael Jackson's best, best friends with little Kathy Richards and little Kathy Richards, her sister, uh, Kim Richards was um, returned to Witch Mountain for Disney. She was a Disney kid and she was in a couple other Disney movies. And Kyle Richards is a real housewife of Beverly Hills. So uh, little Kathy, her daughter, you might know Paris and Nikki Hilton. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the um, little Kathy's daughter, Paris, and Michael's daughter, Paris, they were best friends. And they agreed when they had their first daughters, they would name them Paris. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's interesting too with, um, in, if you follow Paris Jackson, she is a little witchy seeming and the Sony bought all of the rights because Michael Jackson's mom becomes kind of the heir to, for the children. Sony buys all of Michael's catalog for like $650 million. The entirety. This is all the Jackson songs. This is all of Elvis songs, all the Beatles songs, all of Britney songs, all of like you think of an artist, all of Motown, all of Michael owns them. And so the idea that they Sony Music bought back this for 650 million from her is like less than pennies on the dollar. And um Michael's last tour was going to be called This Is It. And his last words on stage, when you look at all his speeches, when people pull out like Prince and they're like, Prince was saying some stuff. Nothing like Michael Jackson was saying. Yeah, they don't you, care about us. Even the video was like next level. The next level, all of the black and white, even him doing that thing to try to show us, look at the CGI and the special effects happening in that video and tell me they haven't been using this stuff on us forever. He was letting us know that the black and white, the elephant man with the skulls, he made it known that he had a skull of the elephant man. So we would know there was power in skulls. Like he, I just, Michael Jackson to me was the biggest setup of all time. And I think there was nobody smarter. And if you listen to Michael Jackson interviews, he says all this stuff about the music industry, all this stuff about Hollywood. I actually think he was a safe haven for kids. And um, his last words were the best is yet to come. And if anyone could have faked their death, like I just think Elvis, when you become glasses and sideburns, it's very easy for you to die on a toilet, peel off your sideburns and walk out of the same (laughs) hotel. And so for Michael, Nobody would know what that MF was. Well, he had a freaking like. jetpack. So, I mean, if you've got a jetpack, you can probably fake your own death. <laughs> Yeah, I just think nobody knows what Michael Jackson looks like. What a perfect thing that he did. And he was the first one wearing a mask years before COVID. It's That's like a, a mask, yeah, a like prosthetic mask. <laughs> It's like like really in plain sight. I think we're all so broken now. The easiest way to hide truth is right in plain sight. If they want to smuggle kids, they just give them a little scopolamine and walk them right through Disney World. Like, I don't think they have to go in all these underground tunnels. I just think they're, come with me. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of that, I mean, we're, we're free form here. We're just kind of chilling and, and chatting. Where That's are we, open. by the way? Are we live? <laughs> We're, we're live everywhere but YouTube. I think we're on Twitch and Rockfin and Rumble oh, okay. and Twitter and whatever else. Facebook. I don't. I don't. I don't want anything to get burnt. But if any of those get burnt, I don't care too much. Okay, um, heard. So yeah, say whatever you want. <laughs> I'm gonna find it so I can retweet it too. That's why I was like, "Where are we right now?" So we. Um, but we're. You just mentioned like the the trafficking. No one even mention uh, notice it. And I just wanted to do a shout out to uh, Rotting Jewels, Dana, because some of the stuff that she's been putting out 
lately has been blowing my mind. One of them is this link between the Process Church and the Best Friends Animal Society and a number of other sort of like animal rights organizations. And outside of going through like all the nitty gritty, one of the parts that comes up is that they have these arrangements with Canada and Mexico and other countries where they can sort of, um, I don't say traffic, but they can transport large amounts of, of animals uh, across the border and they kind of get like a fast pass, right? So you like sign up at the, um, at the airport to like get through the fast pass because it's like, Hey, you know me, I come here all the time. Let me just, you know, go through here, do a quick scan. So there's some aspect of that that they're using for animals from the process church, which is like the OG, like real Satanism, not, and this is, I was uh, talking to my girlfriend about this a little earlier, trying to explain it in like an, in a normie sense. Right. And she's not a total normie cause she's lived with me for over 10 years. <laughs> so not a, not a total normie, but the best explanation I can come up with, which might be wrong. If someone wants to correct me, it's fine. But you've got the church of Satan. This is the Anton LaVey, Sammy Davis, Jr. Hollywood. Like let's get into the paper. Oh, cool. They're having fun parties. That's like the popular kid version of Satanism. Then you got the Temple of Satan or the Satanic Temple. I, I think it's the Temple. Say, I don't know. Um, but the one that, that's run by Lucian Greaves, I guess, is his name, which is a fake name to, to do with the milky eye, right? They're like the, the litigious arm of Satanism. They're the ones that'll uh, make sure that they get a statue next to any other religious statue in a state capitol, or they'll do an after school program for kids about Satanism, or, you know, all of these things. It, it's sort of like the Washington, D.C. courtroom version of Church of Satan. So instead of being popular, they're kind of sticking it to them, like using the system against them, right? But then you've got the process church which seems like it's the like the quote unquote real Satanism. This is like the real animal sacrifice and trafficking and all of like the blood magic and the serial killers and son of Sam. This gets linked to the process church and the process church is in very lots of evidence to show that they might be kind of behind these best friend animal societies and ASPCA and PETA because a, it gives them an endless supply of, I guess, you know, sacrifice. But now they've got this like trafficking network set up. So like they already have a way to transport live things across borders and in semis and at scale. So how hard would it be to slip a person in amongst, you know, all the dogs and the abused animals that are going in and out? So there's something that might actually... No, I'm going to add to all of this. This is not just a theory. This is something I've been screaming from the rooftops for fucking years. And the art in the embassy is one of them. This is one of the ways they do it so that customs can't check their packages. Art can go between any embassy without them checking. Another thing that they can do is tell you that they have a pizza parlor and a pizza parlor. If I'm ordering specific type of tomatoes, I've worked in restaurants for a super long time and I've worked under some of the best chefs in the world. You cannot have certain type of pizza. You cannot call your pizza certain type of names unless the tomatoes and the cheeses come directly from Italy. And those are so expensive that nobody can open it in customs. And the containers of these cheeses are 50 gallon drums a lot of the times, or sometimes 25 gallon, easy to transport humans in them. They all go in the same semis. Another thing that you're not able to open is ice cream. Ice cream is you can get specific kinds of milk, cow milk, goat milk, everything for your creamery, and they're not allowed to open it. So with the animals. Kind of, well, I've never heard this this before ever. So what, how big this, are we talking about cases of ice cream, like enough to fit a human body inside? Um, yeah, but more like a human child a lot of the time. It depends on how much cream you're ordering or butter from specific places. But you can't open some stuff because the second air goes in after it's sealed, it will ruin the product inside. So a uh, a lot of the times way back when um, there's like tomatoes that have to come off a specific side of a specific hill for your pizza to be called a certain type of pizza. And there's certain kinds of cheeses that are only from like champagne only comes from the champagne region. Right. You cognac only, call... only comes from the cognac. Yes. Region. Yeah. Yes. And so certain kinds of food, when America becomes this whole foodie melting pot, it like in especially New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. So you, we have these foodie, any place they call the foodie place, which now would be like a Portland, Oregon, maybe a Tampa, Florida. These are places that they're allowed to bring in this food and they can say like, "Ooh, it's you can't open my foie gras. You can't open my sweetbreads. These are 
like the nicest sweetbreads. So another way they do this, and I always say, and we actually talked about it on our episode, is Lisa Vanderpump, another Real Housewife. And this is why I watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Everybody thinks it's my trash TV, but really it's the TV show. I feel like it's the Tom Hanks of TV shows. If you want a conspiracy (laughs) attached to every single one of them, I could do it myself. But for some reason, me and my Maria together, I'm like, let's just do the Real Housewife conspiracy. It's so big and it attaches to everything. So Lisa Vanderpump heads up a thing called the Yulin Dog Fest. Like she's tried to put a stop to it since the beginning of their show. It's the Lychee the Dog, Dog Fest. Dog Fest? Lychee Dog Festival. If you're going okay. to L-Y-C-H-E-E. If you look into it, don't look at images. You'll horrify yourself if you don't. Like you'll horrify yourself. Is this the one in, in uh, China? Yes. Okay. And the, so part of the thing is they could breed dogs for this, but they found if you coddle a dog and then they torture it, they get more adrenaline from it. They, they get and it induces more. You so can say adrenochrome. That's the whole point. Yeah, where oh, yeah. They, on YouTube. <laughs> it gets, they get more adrenochrome from it. So they'd rather steal dogs that were coddled from all over than breed dogs for this festival. And the torture is part of the thing. I, the, So that's one side. The thing that first made me notice this because Howard Stern is the first idol I ever slayed for myself and him and Beth. O, which I feel like is his, witch. this is when he takes his, when he gets a divorce from his first wife and gets married to Beth. O, everything changes for Howard. That's when he um, decides to completely play ball. If he wasn't always playing ball. So they start um, an animal shelter and everything's attached to this. Rachel Ray, all these Billy Joel, all these weird celebrities in New York. And they always have one eyed cats, one are, you know, three legged animals. They always have like animals that I believe not only are they rescuing the animal rescuing, I believe they're actually torturing the animal because I think karmically, if I kill the kid and eat the kid, something retribution energetically has to be done. So I also have to maybe hurt the animal and then take care of the animal. Like there's an energy exchange that the more animals I save, karmically it's not going to hurt me if i hurt a few kids and i think it's something that they're also doing here but all these celebrities are mixed in with um not that you never hear them with save the children you never hear them with anything it's all save the animals uh, maimed animals is like the like a carbon credits of adrenochrome yes that's what i think it's like somehow like a karmic thing but howard and beth i think everyone should look into them she runs like that puppy bowl or kitty bowl or some shit too um oh no i don't we're getting close to home here because i actually know someone that's that's behind the puppy bowl. i don't (laughs) oh god (laughs) well they might i so many people don't happen so whatever (laughs) so many people are unknowingly um doing it but even like humane society the humane thing about humane society is that sometimes animals get put down that's the humane thing about the humane society and no matter your no-kill shelter in your town your no-kill shelter uses the humane society you just don't know about it i don't know it's weird (laughs) <laughs> and I it's believe animals problem. like I think humane society is one of the, like a great thing out there. I'm not anti-humane society. I don't think there should be animals running them up, but somewhere it all is part of a psyop. Somewhere well, energetically. Part of the, the hard to determine point here is that if you are pro humane society or let's say best uh, animal, best friend society, whatever, are you pro Satanist? If you know about it, does that now mean that you're donating to Satanism the second you find out? Is this like when they send the the Christian missionaries to like Haiti and they've never, you know, wherever, somewhere in Africa and they've never heard of Jesus? And it's like if they hadn't heard of it, they automatically go to heaven. But now if they've heard of it, now they go to hell if they don't follow it. It, it feels like a similar <laughs> aspect here. I know. It's almost like if a, a, anyone from a church ever lands on your shores, you'd be better off just plugging your ears and running away. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> at least you're like, what? I didn't know. <laughs> like ignorance. And that's, well, that's only, I think that's only Catholicism that has been explained to me. 
Oh my like, gosh. That's the have same reason heard- the babies get a pass. The new thing that I think is a big psyop coming out, and I've noticed it, is um, Greek Orthodox. Have you yeah. seen all yeah. this like new sect of conspiracy theorists that they, like, you know, they woke up over the last like I always like to put it in days to show them to themselves how ridiculous. Over the last twelve hundred days, they just realized nine eleven was an inside job, but now they have the truth about like Greek or Greek Orthodox. I'm like, get out of here! Doesn't anybody else have an attention span to remember when this person was telling you like whatever other kooky thing? Like there is somebody that has followers that literally said that the Galactic Federation of Light talked to them and that then Jesus was their homeboy and now they're into Greek Orthodox. Like, Who is this? Are we allowed Kara to say Kara Mosher. I don't understand. Who? Kara Mosher. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah, I call her Kosha Mosher. Um, I don't know. I just think it's really strange to me. Um that you look at spill tea. Oops, I just said a name. I just think it's so strange that people's followers aren't holding like them accountable. Like imagine if you were going to a church every day telling you about the galactic federation of light. And then, and not that people aren't allowed to get saved, but just imagine like respecting the mental fortitude of somebody that you've watched them accept a new Messiah every six months since 2021. Like what in the hell? And while judging everybody else, like trying to tell it, like I'm going to take paranoid Americans content about something that he did all this research on. I'm going to regurgitate it and like the exact same thing, not do a whole bunch of other work on it. And my audience really comes to me. Like I should be on any kind of pedestal, but I have literally told you about four different churches I've backed in less than thousand days. A thousand days. I've picked a new Messiah for myself, four of them. I just think this shit's crazy. I don't understand how everybody else can't sit back sometimes and just be like, what? Like this black pill dude literally sat there with his mouth shut for a year. And now he has this whole slant about how these other dudes weren't around in the like You never even seen him before. I just think more people need to call it out, even if they don't have a platform. Like, seriously, this is why Kara Mosher triggers me. She sold readings to my friends and then told them they were demonic. How are you going to (laughs) sell readings? You were used as an instrument of Satan and now people should follow you anywhere. How are you going to do that? Get out of here. But we're also in a place that everyone's like, oh, don't say a word. Don't be, be, burn a bridge. Cheney, you don't want to. You don't want someone praying too hard about you. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> well, and, and you have been accused of trying to use black magic uh, mm-hmm. in my behalf. And I, I appreciate that. I know. I always think it's so funny when people come at Masons like you're at the clubhouse sitting with a bunch of dudes in like movie chairs staring at a checkerboard floor talking about some random dude on X that makes you mad. And that person on X is like, oh, I'm going to out you because I have fear in my heart about this thing. Mason, 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 you know, the secret society that everyone knows about. And I'm going to out it. I'm going to be the only person to out what we all know. But I like to just like, if you already believe in this huge fairy tale, I'm a witch. And I'm a digital maid. Ooh. And then they're like, ah, and all I need them to do is observe me. And now I just became more powerful. <laughs> it, it, I don't ever do anything. That, uh, that you found out that you've got like family, like your grandpa or something was a Mason. Mm. Right. And Both my grandfather. Me for that? The, the people find that out and they're like, oh, now I can't ever listen to anything you say again. Both my grandfathers were Masons. 32nd degree. Um, one of them, I believed he was really attached to the Illinois mafia somehow. I believe that Illinois became so powerful because it had to get everything between LA and New York, all of the trafficking, all the post office. So I believe my grandfather owned a post office outside of Chicago just for this kind of stuff. And, um, the more I look into him, I always remember sitting and listening to him teach my, my, I have my brother's two years younger than me. 
And he would always teach him parallel lines is the one that always stuck in my head. Like my brother didn't care. He didn't want to grasp it at all. But I would always try to like play Legos or blocks or fake read my book what, where he was giving the lessons to my brother so I could eavesdrop. And I don't know why parallel lines is the one that always stuck in my head. But What about uh, parallel lines? Uh, I always felt like he was talking about timelines. I always felt like even in my little kid brain, I always felt like he was showing my brother how easy it was to just go from here to here. And that there was something, some kind of like, this is in my little kid brain that I felt this. And so I always thought the Masons were doing something magic. And then I saw a show called Peggy Sue Got Married with, um, Kathleen Turner, I think, oh, is that yeah, it? Yeah, of course. And Nick, Nicholas Cage. And when she goes back in time on that parallel timeline, that's I felt like I had this like deja vu. She just over one thing, and the only way she can get back to her real life is going to her grandfather, who's the Mason. And they don't call it a Mason in that. But in my head, how many lodges I grew up in. And I've sat when everyone talks about sacred temples and all these things that the Masons won't let you do. The amount of halls that I sat in growing up and the amount of like I've touched the stones. I've sat on the checkerboard floors and tied my shoes like it's a place very comfortable to me. And I like the kitchen of it different, like the lodge part different than the ceremony room. And then my stepdad, he was a third. 32nd degree Mason as well. So yeah, if the Masons are around, um, they've handled me. <laughs> I've never uh, Eastern starred, but I've done some Crisio things and uh you know, Job. Uh never did anything like that. My dad wouldn't let me join anything. My dad never joined, and my dad never let me join any clubs. He never it was a big thing for him, even in school or any he was like, never join anything. You're never even when I was a welder, never join a union. Um really? Yeah, he didn't he never he thought somebody having their hand in your pocket to dictate your politics in any way was a silly idea. I mean, Masons kind of were like an early form of a union. That's like a really, it's like very similar. Yeah, my dad didn't. He he never joined the Masons. My dad is the only one of my grand, my uncle's a 32nd degree Mason and work for uh, Martin Marinetta or yeah, uh, Lockheed Martin, you know, out in Colorado. And my dad never joined. So, uh -huh. I don't know. And he never really let me join anything. He never let me join the Girl Scouts. <laughs> what about uh, later in life? Have you ever considered joining anything? Just the welding union. I thought it was a good thing at one time. And he told me, just work on the shipyard where the union is present. If you think something they're doing is good, then they can't offer anyone in the union something that everybody else on the shipyard's not getting. So just make sure they're there and you never have to join them. And it was true. Like if I would have done something shitty or something stupid, maybe I would have needed the union's attorneys, but I never planned on doing that kind of stuff. The idea of paying dues is weird. Another very Masonic thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like it's, it's the whole masonry all the way. And I, and I guess we'll just, I'll just keep on the hot takes here. Um, but there was this, uh, I know it was a meme. I know 100% was a meme from like the Red Scare pod, I think. But it really like struck a chord with me because they had this picture of Masonic membership. And it was, it's basically in free fall, right? It's just like a straight line just falling down. Um, and, and then they had a graph of the number of people that live in the US. And it was almost inverse, right? So it's clearly showing that people are not joining the Masons anymore. And just Masons are, are probably on their way out in a very big way. And correlation, causation, fallacy. But is this partly the answer of like, why is society seeming to like, you know, completely decay? And I don't know if I actually believe that part that like we're actually decaying any more than when Socrates said it about the youth of his day. And it was like, all oh, these kids are, are writing books, you know, and it's like, Oh wow. Like, oh, what a horrible world. All these kids are writing all these books and putting filth out into the world. But that was really what they were saying. Right. So now it's like a modern version of that, but maybe the downfall of society is that less and less people are trying to join the Masons or Masonic like organizations because 
once you get through all the degrees where you have to kill the babies and drink like the goat blood, like that's all the child's play stuff. Once you get through that and you get to like level 32, then they tell you it's really about trying to maintain society. And and I guess the way that I've put it into my brain because I'm a, a Masonic brainwashed MK ultra victim, but it's almost like a seed bank for ideas. If you know that, culture is about to take a nosedive and everything that we've known is about to be burnt. All the libraries of Alexandria are going to be burnt all over again. Then you don't write the stuff down. You keep it committed to memory and you only give it to people that you also think aren't going to profane it and like ruin it for everyone else. And maybe that's part of what masonry is. It's, it's really just like a seed bank for ideas. Cause it's not like no one's ever allowed in. You just have to prove that you actually want to be in there and prove that you're in there for the right reasons and maybe a little bit of proof that I, I'm not overstepping my bounds. I think that you've got like mental acuity that you, that you've got a memory that you know what words mean that you can kind of like read between lines. Once you've proven all of that, you're pretty much in uh, there's not like a, I mean, aside from killing the babies and drinking the goat blood, that's a given. Once you get past all that, it's, it feels very altruistic. The most altruistic group I've ever been in. And less gay than the military. I'll say that outright. I The Masons that I know, like the scholarships that I know that they give out, the things that I know they do for the town, the, the towns that I have enjoyed in my life have a very strong presence of Masons in the town. The towns that have been shoddy in life aren't, they're like, Hollywood. It's a whole different. Portland, Oregon doesn't have a strong Masonic presence. You might find a Masonic building. You might be able to take a picture, but there isn't a whole bunch of dudes around joining the Masons. And when you even in my town in Florida, if you go to the Masonic Lodge, the last funeral I went to there, um, they were all old men. So old, like yeah, well, crib keeper yeah. old. The average age of the Masonic lodges I've personally been to, the average age is probably around sixty-eight ish. Um, so it's it's very much like there's nothing else for you to do. The wife goes and drops grandpa off, and he's got something that he can do for a little while. And they talk about mashed potatoes and you know who died and who's medical. Like if you've ever been in a room with a bunch of like seventy-year-old friends and family that's a lot of the masonic lodges i've been to now i've i've heard stories from a lot of different people even some that have left my lodge to gone to other ones that were like oh you should go and do this one it's all like younger folks there's lots of 30 year olds in there and uh, i mean i i don't really care i found out even after joining the masons that i'm so anti-social that even like a niche of esoteric people talking about stuff i find interesting even that was like too social for me so um, I, I don't go to as many meetings and everything as, as I could, but, uh, yeah, I, I feel that there's, it's, it's like a little social club and not and at risk of sounding like we're just sitting here opining and like, um, uh, you know, giving the Masons all this benefit of doubt. Like there's weird stuff that goes on in Masonic lodges. There's weird people in there. There was actually a dude, one of the coolest ones that I met was convinced that every single Masonic ritual was real magic. And we were actually doing incantations and summoning daemons and everything. And this is not like a conspiracy. Well, maybe it was conspiracy theorist, but like this was a brother of the lodge. You know, he's been in the Masons for longer than I had been in the Masons. And I remember at that point was like, wait, like you're, you know, about like Aleister Crowley and conspiracy theories and uh, you know, like all like the, the, the rumors about the Templar and Baphomet. And he's like, Oh yeah, that's why I'm here. You know what I mean? And it, and it wasn't like, that's why I'm here because I want to lick cats butts and kill kids. It was like, I'm interested in these weird occult topics that don't come up in any other room you could ever be in with a group of people, except this room. Like this is the room that if you want to talk about is the statue of Liberty Lucifer. Uh, and you don't want to do it on Twitter with a bunch of freaking um, narcissistic, you know, people that just, cram information from ai but this is like where people actually learn and care about it so i don't know it was it's an interesting place to be at or maybe even before you know the internet and before everything was so accessible to us um who was talking about this kind of thing who was talking about the powers that might be in the world and the magics that might exist and then in a society way i know even the people that are living most out in the middle of nowhere and they're just trying to create a nice little community for their children 
you're creating a little society and there's certain parts of society that as much as we hate it for things to be, it's not about a man, like a man can protect himself in so many situations, like so many things. The reason that a man sets forth laws, I believe is because he realizes that women and children aren't always safe from other men. Like a man doesn't need somebody to say, don't kill me or don't lie to me. He'll fucking take care of it. Like if the world was just full of men and you didn't have to worry about like weak little ladies or kids, the it would be such a different playground. But I think a, a lot of those rules of society are set there. So the women and the weaker then and the children and the old people are kept safe. And the strong men know this. And so somewhere... They wrote it in stone. And that is in the idea of what the oldest Mason would mean to me is they were men that knew how to build societies. And that doesn't exist anymore. It's been stripped away. Why would we think, look at, no one picked up a gun. They knew their election was stolen. No one cares. Like they just go on about their life. Most of these guys wore a mask to just, I don't want to lose my job. Most of them let their kids get vaccinated because they're like, I don't want to get in an argument with my wife. Like this kind of is the new mentality of men. So why Masons would be scary for them because most of them don't know how to pick up a hammer. Most of them don't know how to carve anything. They don't know how to weld. They don't know how to carpentry. They don't know how to read a blueprint. So the idea of building a society is so frightening because they don't know how to use one tool. They can't build a household. <laughs> so I understand why a whole group calling themselves builders and masons would be the most frightening thing. And then they're going to sit like little women behind a knitting circle and be really scared of it. And then maybe they're going to like sew their esoteric symbols into quilts that they never know what they mean because they they're they're never going to be a group a guy that hangs out with other guys they do it on a microphone when in society thousands of years the ones with all the words used to be the women the men had the actions and the ladies had the words that's why we cuckle so much because we were back in the village raising the kids and taking care of the old people it's a weird thing now that we're in this place that women have huge voices that they can speak up for themselves but men are the ones on the microphones with all the words it's a, it shouldn't be that way. Like men should be building the things and the lady should be, cluck, 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 cluck. but we're in this <laughs> like reversal. I wonder in, in, a, in a theoretical future environment, let's say that they've got like the little life pods and a dude can just, you know, make his own kid. No, no woman needed. Yeah, you no. just pay the fee and you get the kid out. Who needs that? And, and let's say that we figure that part out. Right. And, uh, do you think that there's a certain point that men would start protecting weaker men if they were if like kids and women weren't in the picture somehow or or does that line stop at women and children like if, it, if it's just a bunch of like everyone's the same age a bunch of 40 year old dudes and there's a bunch of alpha chads with muscles and a bunch of weak little uh well you know people that, that maybe are not the alpha chads do the alpha chads just inherently like i need to protect or do you think that goes out the window when the, the gender separation is not there? I don't think it would only be about protecting themselves now. How am I going to be the alpha Chad? Or how am I going to get the alpha Chad a gift so that he doesn't hurt me or he treats me like one of his? Prison rules. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would all be about who's the scariest guy and how am I going to make the scariest guy or become the scariest guy? Like if it's a world without any women or kids, that's why I think it's so funny. We always like, you know, Amazonian women get brought up or the island of Lesbos and how it's like these little blips of topic. But let's talk about it on the other reverse. <laughs> Isn't doesn't it seem like every commune you take like um, I'm a, you know, I'm a Hollywood person and now I'm starting a commune in the middle of nowhere. And every this is what I never understand about dudes starting cults or communes piece of advice, pretend it's a club and always invite the ladies first. You want to have ladies night, ladies drink free, because otherwise you always are going to end up in a sausage fest. So in the last, like since 2020, I've watched a whole bunch of these dudes. They're going to move out to the middle of nowhere and they're going to have their <laughs> sausage fest out in the middle of nowhere. And it's like them and six other dirty guys. There's not a woman in sight, but they show up on their YouTube all the time and make sure you pay their Patreon and do all this stuff because they live off grid and they're just figuring out this stuff out and it's just like oh my gosh like 
who would ever follow anyone out to that rape fest that they're creating out there? <laughs> like what? It just seems like a circle jerk and maybe you have one cow for a little while. I don't know. I, it just never seems appealing. There's never like you guys don't have enough flowers to get any ladies to your property. <laughs> I feel like you've opened the door to this this topic a little bit now, but like the circle jerk and the sausage fest and all that uh, and the cult, there's this uh, the box saga thing has come up a few times recently. And that's, this is a little bit of the vibe I get. And there's there's also like an anti-Christian vibe in here. There's a lot to unpack. We're not going to do it all in one show, but box saga feels to me like remember when dudes were just dudes and we could just like sit around naked and just jerk each other off. Like as, as dudes, not as gay, you know, like not as like a girl boy sexual thing, but just like bros being bros, sports, beer, chicken wings, jerking each other off, like all on the same platform. The phrase of circle jerk, like let's see who can come the first while we're watching WWE. Right. Like it wasn't gay. We were just Dude, it, it was, like I mean, and, and not to just be a complete degenerate, but there, I I understand at a at like a male psychological level this aspect of like, hey bro, I got this itch on my back, and like I can't I can't watch the movie, I can't pay attention to the game because there's like this itch on my back that I can't quite get. You just scratch it for me. He scratches you for five seconds, the itch goes away, and you're like, okay, God, thank you, you know, like that that thing is no longer bothering me there's like a certain element of that where it's like we just want to be a bunch of bros we want to solve the problems of the world we're going to sit around on a bonfire oh shit i can't concentrate hey bro can you help me concentrate real quick okay now that that's over let's go back to talking about sports and like that i don't know if that uh if that is conveyed well as i'm trying to describe it but there's like this aspect it's like a like a utilitarian feel to it and of course, like your bros doing that isn't a gay thing. It's like, bro, scratch my back. Like, I, sometime in the past, there's been two completely alpha chad, hetero, homophobic dudes, right? That went to the beach and was like, bro, could you put some tan lotion on my back? Like, I can't reach it, right? And like, there's a small moment in time when you're allowed to do it and it's not gay. Like, it, like, all rules are off. You can fucking you roll, rub your homie down with a little bit of oil just because there's like a practical use for it. And it's not for like the benefit of it or like the pleasure of either person. Right. It's got a utility. So I think there's an aspect of the box saga that's like, let's just pretend it's all utilitarian. Like there's nothing sexual about it at all. So that means if we do this to ourselves, then like we're not gay for it. Like we're just kind of doing what nature's would do normally. So I don't know. There's there's a fun little cult version of that. It's kind of the same though as the Shivan Boo where people are drinking their pee pee. It's very similar where you're Wait, such what? an arse. This is new. It, this is new it, to me. You know the people that are drinking their piss and wiping so, it in their eyes? No. I've I've heard of old people drinking the the urine of young children because it's supposed to be some kind of adrenochrome antioxidant but i've ne i haven't heard of what you're talking about so you need to inform me it's called shivan boo and in the probably around 2021 there was this time that the no fap movement had really taken off and you don't see it anymore but there was this time that guys were so impressed with themselves that they didn't jerk off that they needed to tell everyone online that they hadn't touched themselves for a certain <laughs> amount of days so they were like oh my gosh i'm 10 days no fap and right around the same time these same dudes that were so impressed that they didn't touch their own peepees like a toddler um and had to tell us about it every day i'm no fap and then women were like I honor them. I honor them. They're not touching themselves because those are the coddling moms that created the opioid epidemic to begin with. But so no fab, no fab. Then these same narcissists thought I can drink my own pee and it's healing because it's this men thing too. This is what's happening because there is divine properties of men and there's divine properties of women. And because of the whole trans agenda, we're losing that. And so some men they want healing juice to come out of them too. They want it to come out of their nipples and they want it to come out of their pee pees. And they want to, they want their bodies to give life too. So it said, if you eat like fruit for five days, your urine becomes a certain amount of super nutrient and you can drink it and rub it in your eyes and rub it on your skin. And it heals you when in reality, 
you could probably just eat fruit for five days. <laughs> you don't then have to take your liquid and rub it on yourself. But it's like this whole crazy thing so that really deep down, men can have a liquid comparable to breast milk. It's so desperate for men to have something that provides this much nutrients and this much healing power that they need to even give themselves hormones and testosterone now so they can really have an ooze come out of their tits. And there's real doctors and nurses now training men how to breastfeed children. This is insanity. But it's all so that somewhere deep down, if I just suck my own cock, like if I just suck my own, then I'm the Ouroboros. I'm the Horoboros. <laughs> this actually is very similar to the homunculus concept in, in my mind that the reason why alchemists and even today men are obsessed with the concept of homunculus uh, small brained men, which don't have a lot of mental capacity, shout out one, um, that can't just get off this homunculus topic. But it's because the fascination of like, it's not fair that women can create life. There has to be a way that I can create life. And more, more than that, there's got to be a way that I can go and hermit out in the woods and just become a crusty old dude that doesn't cut his nails and clean his hair or bathe or do anything. Like I should be able to just play in cow poop and still have, again, a little buddy or a little progeny. And why should I have to clean myself and adapt to society just so that I can have a new little me to pass all my knowledge on to? That's ridiculous. Like, but by shacking up with a woman, again, anti-box saga, right? By doing that, like you would compromise so much of yourself and lose so much of your knowledge. So the perfect solution is like, Oh, I can just go and jerk off in some cow poop and then come back 30 days later under a full moon and my little buddy's there. And now he, I've got a little assistant. I've got someone that I can convey knowledge to. And that is such an appealing, I guess, you know, idea of like, oh, I don't ever have to know how to, uh, you know, socialize with a person, especially of the other sex. I can just do all that myself. Like it's the ultimate DIY uh, weekend project, you know what I mean? And that's, I mean, that appeals to guys like weekend projects are a, a huge selling point. And what if we even have stories like the Virgin Mary who she self alchemized and had her own baby. We have stories of her maphrodites, hermaphrodites, gods that could self procreate Nimrod. Nim means no rod. It literally means he had no rod. And I didn't everybody, hear that before. Every, like, everybody just thinks of things, how they're written. Like, that's how it's given to me. Nimrod, Nimrod, Nimrod. But it, Nim means no. And so he has no dick. And everybody talks about how they maybe changed time and how they went through and they put an X over things to add time on. But why wouldn't they have gone through and added beards on Gilgamesh to hide tits? Why wouldn't if the original deity was an Afro deity, if the original thing was the Venus of Willendorf and she had huge tits that could feed everyone and she was voluptuous and you could see her vagina, if all that was real, I even think the idea of a big bang is a big splooge. It's because they're so scared they came out of a vesica Pisces. They're so scared they came out of a rift when Jesus is the representation of the Pisces and Mary is the representation of every single thing you've ever heard Hermes talk about. If you were to create gold inside yourself, it would be another child. And so I hear stories of the Amazonian. I hear stories of Lesbos. I hear stories of Mary, but nowhere, I hear stories of Lilith, but nowhere do I ever hear a real story of a guy making a homunculus. I think that women figured out how to do this and it scares the shit out of guys because then they're not needed anymore. And that's the big berry. And I think it's so crazy to think about, but we have proof that it's happening all over the world with like chickens who were a chicken and then they turn into a rooster and can procreate. Like, you know, I, I just, to me, it's absurd to think that you wouldn't be able to somehow, what, create a little sperm inside yourself and put it up as long as you have a womb you're good to go. So I think there's some kind of jealousy, especially if there was a fallen, if there was a nephalon, if there was the beginning, it takes a big womb to make giants. The fallen were never men, but that's 
the gods always are men because I think the powers in the 3D in the flesh are men. And so they can't have the womb and a soft, big titted fat thing actually be the Afro deity. They need to make Gilgamesh, Nimrod. Look at the muscles. He's holding a lion in his arms. He didn't, a lady doesn't need to grab the lion by the scruff. She calls it with her wiles. That's why Mary Magdalene walked through the desert with big cats. So there's so many things that a guy has to power something that a girl uses her wiles to get it. And so the worlds we live in are completely different. I think the power structures, even if the witch trials, like your, you know, the Jerusalem witch trials, the Salem witch trials, Jerusalem used to be called Salem. Salem just means salt. If time was stolen, maybe the biggest thing isn't that this dude came back three days later. It was literally the three Marys that stood around him and did the spell. I was um, thinking right now, you said like giants (laughs) need a a big womb, right? Like, that would flip the whole dating game on its head. So now instead of like looking around and seeing like, Oh, look at the rock on that one. It's like, what do you go up to a girl? Like, Hey girl, how big's that uterus? <laughs> well, breeding hips, this term breeding hips is for real. So the reason men like an hourglass figure is because those hips need less time to expand, which means that her birth is going to be easier. Her labor is going to be less. So it, actually, in the grand scheme of things, if we were all living in the wild, you would want a girl that could have a quick labor because we don't know if we're going to be running from a tiger three hours from now. So that hourglass figure, her big tits meant she was supple and could feed and then her hips meant she could breed so that is why we like that that's why we're turned on by that juicy and and it also if she's juicy and not frail she has all the nutrients inside herself to feed that to feed your offspring and as a man you notice that you don't want a stick figure because you're like that stick figure doesn't have enough calories to feed a little me This is a fine day, friend. I think we're solving the problems of the world on this. We're just supposed <laughs> to be casually playing games and like shooting shit. But <laughs> this is how we hide it. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking bulls. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get myself so crazy high today. I'm so glad to be off. I'm glad you're off too. And and uh, we were we were also talking about a couple of shows to maybe brainstorm. So maybe let's brainstorm some shows. One of those that's kind of been in the back pocket. Um, I'm like halfway done doing the research, but we were talking about Howard Hughes and Hollywood. So I wanted to hear like, what, what's your surface level take outside the deep research? Like why is Howard Hughes and Hollywood an interesting topic for you? I believe Howard Hughes is the original Elon Musk. I believe every way, even bigger If you want to tie into politics, into the military industrial complex, into Hollywood, into world affairs, and then to everything magic and the occult, I think Howard Hughes, 8888, I think Howard Hughes is the number one untapped well in conspiracy. But I know this is what another reason that when probably like I'll I'll pat me and you on the back when you've been woke as long as we have we've gotten to watch everyone go through these cycles of things of like oh they're caught up in Israel for a little while oh they just met the Catholic Church oh oh my gosh they found out who the Pacers were um it's like we get to watch everyone from afar kind of go through these cycles of like oh I hope they don't get trapped in Gematria for too long um <laughs> you know like oh shit like it you guys. I don't know. I won't even get into it because even my rant and is it's what well, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because there's one aspect of this where like someone who's never heard of the Illuminati before, for example, and they get into it, not just like, oh, interesting. Like someone will be like, dude, have you ever heard about this Bavarian Illuminati before? You like like a non-internet, you know, normie friend. And I'm just thinking, like, oh man, in about, I don't know, three to six months from now, if you if you pursue this path. You're going to be talking shit about the Masons. I know it. I know it for a fact. <laughs> but then you might get over that hump and then you're going to start talking about the UN and the Federal Reserve. And I think then it's like you're making progress, right? But some people never get over that very first hump and it just goes all out. But what what about Howard Hughes and the occult? Oh, yeah. I didn't I didn't know there was even a lot of uh, like crossover between the occult and Hughes. 
I um, think that a lot of the women who handled him, there's the Joan Crawfords and stuff of Hollywood. And because I think we're supposed to be on the timeline, on the parallel timeline, that is Hillary's second presidency. I've seen the vision of Hillary's second presidency, and this is where we're supposed to be living. Um, The witch hunt and the witch was always supposed to be their power. It takes away their power when a man says the witch hunt's coming after him. It takes away all the feminist movement when ha- uh, Trump says, witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt is the greatest witch hunt. Like when he says this shit, it takes away <laughs> this like woman from being able to say this shit. And so when you look at Howard Hughes and the only people he ever really trusted in Hollywood were this little crew of women. And some people like the paparazzi, which I think the paparazzi is the secret society of good guys. So when they harassed him, he became like one of the first people all through the magazines, his love affairs, his things, his, that to me is hit the protection of him. His father dies. He becomes the world's richest man. Um, and then he's in Hollywood. He's also at the same time, his first movie is almost convincing all of us of how CGI works. They needed clouds. Otherwise the planes look like they were sitting still. And- like that was the biggest get. There's so many other things with like the weather manipulation that goes on around some of his stuff, certain plane crashes that um, I think were predicted by certain people in his life. But then I also think the government had something to do with it. I think the spruce goose, something about a wooden airplane, and then it never really gets to fly. And then it's hanging in Oregon right now. This shit to me is wild. Like this is a spell wood and metal and they don't want our guns because they're pew pew. There's metal in our guns. They don't want us to have a money shortage because they give a shit about our dollar bills. They want our change. And um, I think our real woods and our real metals that sit in America are our alchemy. And so even 9-11, when those buildings crumble, they want that metal out of here. They want the asbestos out of here. And asbestos is one of the gifts from Venus. So it's, I don't know. I, I, my stone brain just went on like 45 different things about Howard Hughes <laughs> from Howard Hughes. They, they also got, they always get rid of the wreckage. Even after uh, Oklahoma City, they also shipped all of that wreckage out to China. Like, get it out of here. And uh, th- this is, I believe this is from the John DeCamps book, uh, the Franklin cover up. But in his book, he cites, or in, in the addendum to one of the future releases, he mentioned that the name of the company that shipped the wreckage out from OKC overseas was called uh, JFK demolition or something. So it was like this little, like rub some salt in the wound. Like, ha, 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 we're going to take one tragedy and use it to like, just spit in your face with this next tragedy. And this do the spruce goose. I, I hope that you jump into a little bit more of the spruce goose research because my research into Howard Hughes took me down a completely different angle that I've never heard of before, but, even more importantly, when I went online, I didn't find any YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or none of those posts about this one aspect. And that's that Howard Hughes was one of the people that has also been to the lowest point of the planet. And what they were doing was they were trying to f- hear, hear me. Here's the conspiratorial version without having to like try and norm it down. But the conspiratorial version is that if you want to, let's say you're in, in um, Alaska, you're in Antarctica, right? And you know that there's an underground cave system. The best way to get to that cave system is to find the highest point that's underground and then go to that and like kind of drill in. And then you can get inside of it and sort of shimmy down and find this big network. Well, the same thing is like, if you want to figure out how far you can drill down into the earth, maybe there's a resource, maybe it's hollow, who knows? Maybe it's flat and you're trying to find the underside. But what you would do, you wouldn't go to the top of a freaking mountain and start drilling down, right? You'd go and find the lowest place. So that was where it started was like, okay, if we want to drill into the earth, then it would be smart to find the lowest place on earth. So the lowest place on earth, uh, as you might imagine, is uh, is the seafloor. So Howard Hughes starts working with the United States government, top total top secret operation to create this, this deep sea submarine, something that could actually withstand all the pressure and all the resources you would need, the extra air supply. And this is, I think, in like the 50s or so. 
And they actually had like it's a somewhat of a success enough that it becomes completely classified only 10 years later for them to be like, ah, it didn't really go anywhere. You know, it just kind of fizzled out. There's no records because we didn't find anything. But what they had was all the resources, like you said, the first Elon Musk with all this money and and like uh I guess a brain on his head where he like he wanted to find all this stuff out. So they make a submarine, go to the very bottom of the seafloor and start drilling. And this is one of the, the the deepest that I think humans have drilled before. There's another one in Russia. But this is one of the earlier examples of that. And I, I, my conspiracy theory is that this might be tied to the same thing Ghislaine Maxwell was into because Ghislaine Maxwell was big into like protect the seas. And I was just thinking the idiots that died in the crumpled Titanic vessel with the little PlayStation controller, right? If that's the Walmart DIY you know, 20% off special. What's like the, the, uh, you know, I can't remember like the, the ritzy little, um, catalogs where you would go and buy like the massage chairs that were like, you know, $2,000, but like, what's the rich person version of that PlayStation controller Titanic sub. That's kind of what Ghislaine Maxwell probably had. It's definitely what Howard Hughes had. And the whole, like, the ocean has not been explored yet and that there might be passages, there might be tunnels. Who knows, man? Howard Hughes knows. <laughs> Ghislaine Maxwell probably knows. Howard Hughes, it, an interesting thing, too, I which was an immediate connection for me when that Titan sub sank, was that some of the people on board were aeronautics engineers. That's what Howard Hughes was. And he was so brilliant and had the money almost in a way when people talk about Trump getting Tesla's papers. Howard Hughes was essentially this before Hmm. the country and the mayhem ever started. Um, I think Hell's Angels might have been his first film for some reason. I could be totally wrong on that. Like it had something to do with airplanes. It'd be interesting to. We're like, not fact checking on this show. This is yeah. Not we're not fact, fact checking show. this one. Um, I think it's crazy that Leonardo DiCaprio, who is a huge rewriter of history, with um, you know how he plays Edgar, and he play like he likes to take on these like juicy American roles of characters that are real and are zeitgeist and then that just becomes the thing that Howard Hughes was crazy. Now look at he's. A brilliant man, a rich man, a man with more ideas than our actual government that sometimes they are like, what if he's selling these ideas to another country? Is he loyal? There's a whole red scare that go on. And so everyone's like, he's crazy. He's paranoid schizophrenic. But the more I'm learning about schizophrenia in general is it's probably a superpower that attaches to empathy at first and then goes past that. And paranoia most of the people that are paranoid are have a reason to be. So if you're Howard Hughes, they were bugging every single room you were in. They were taking pictures of you everywhere. You didn't know who you could date anymore. You didn't know if you could trust your butler. He wasn't paranoid. He was legitimately locked himself in a room. And especially if you were trying to figure something out, if you were getting to the next level of maybe the sea floor, maybe you found information, or maybe you went to Antarctica or the North Pole or these kind of ideas. Also, you might have information that you're like, somebody wants to kill me. And the only place I know I'm safe is my theater because I built it from the ground up. And so he locks himself in his theater and he won't let anyone in. And like this is the OG paranoid American, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. And didn't they keep him captive for like a decade too somewhere? Well that that was um and my research on this is a little bit loose. So maybe I'm construing some of this, but it was that like he got kidnapped out of a casino and then put into or out of his theater and put into a hotel and that a lot of people called him recluse, but part of that might have been him being held captive, not as much recluse. Uh, although I don't know, I've I've seen the Aviator movie well, again, Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Yeah, uh, where he's like peeing in jars and he's got like long toenails and stuff. They're kind of implying that like he absolutely uh, decayed away. But I don't like how much of that. I wonder is actual truth versus that's the the story that was kind of told because there's less questions to ask about some rich old guy that just like turned into crazy Mr. Burns versus just disappeared off the face of the planet. Or if they were sane and they became a recluse, I don't know. There's something Howard Hughes definitely feels like a huge rabbit hole. And it's like, if we pull enough at it, it'll become a a banned topic on YouTube. I think at some point, (laughs) like you won't be able to talk about Howard Hughes. You'll get struck down for hate speech. I, these are the actual people, though, that I think 
don't look into it's interesting how like the zeitgeist get the one of the reasons that the Q kids were so successful for a period of time is because we all had marching orders every single day we knew what we had to attack every single day we knew what the mainstream media was putting out and so we all attacked it at the same time that's how a bunch of little ants take down a billion dollar news corporation and even keep the word epstein's didn't kill himself and everyone's zeitgeist or even pull apart wayfair like we did so So were these messages straight from q and where did they where were the the messages coming from they would come on the q boards but it would be you know it might be in enough there would be some kids that would dissect the messages but there would be names inside so they would be like you know pick a politician mitch mcconnell uh mitt romney obama or it would be john mccain but his name on there would be no name and everybody would figure out no name it John McCain. So then it would say, where could you find John McCain on these dates? So now we can find all these pictures of John McCain in the Middle East. Who are these people that he's with? So then somebody posts at Q. Is this what you're talking about? Keep digging, Anon. This is all we get. So then somebody lists. These are these people. Oh, my gosh. These people are Al Qaeda. These people are all the weapons runners. Huh? So now just by questions, we, because no information is valuable to anyone when it's spoon fed to you. So because all these little kids looked and we all researched ourselves, now we know the name of all these people. And we're like, huh, John McCain went there and then he sold weapons to those people. And now we're going to war with those people. Wait a minute. It just was to use the Helgelian dialect to kept asking questions until your brain did the work. That's it with Q. So when people hate Q, me and you could have wrote Q. It just could have been every conspiracy we want them to know. It could have been what happened on 9-11-2001. What did the well, media tell you happened? Because when you say the cue boards, are we talking like the poll boards on 4chan? Or was like was there like a specific place that you would go and find it? Well, there was only if you got deep enough into it, you didn't want to go to the main boards and you weren't welcome at the main boards because there was people doing actual work with like algorithms verifying that this came from an exact source. And you didn't want someone on there being like, look at Hillary's in Haiti. Like, duh, bitch, get off here. Like, it it was like the computer (laughs) kids had to take it first. And and it was like hateful. It was all the kids that were actually like the psychos that sit and only know zeros and ones and speak full binary code and know how they have people. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. you know, those are the only ones that were like really on the boards, boards. And then they died. Weaponized autists. Totally. And um, if you really think of like a warfare, you would eventually get us involved. You would eventually get all these kids, all these Gen Xers, all these Project X, if you know all these movies, you'd get us to be involved in taking down the X before it gets here. And so I just think that's what it's kind of all about, even though it, it says a lot about me magic and wizards and warlocks. And that's the stuff that a whole bunch of people bit onto it and it turned into this whole christian right-wing movement that they don't even they're like republicans are right like that's what it turned into but it didn't start out that way it was a whole bunch of like cicada kids and a whole bunch of ex anonymous operation wall street kids and a whole bunch of and ex bernie voters that were like what the hell did i just watch an election be stolen in front of my face and no one's doing anything about it but that's what it started out as q didn't just start out as like a trump thing it was like who is trump these interviews people had to read and like like so the only reason all these videos and attachments are there but the funniest part to me is the amount of conspiracy theorists that are black pilled as fuck and they say things like we're the news now <laughs> that is a q quote like the amount of q quotes that conspiracy theorists that just woke up in the last few years but now they want to sit like they're like so much better than everyone else i watch so many of them online where they're just like look at all these idiots falling for this clickbait again and then they put the link to the clickbait So really, I'm still getting the clicks for the CNN article. I'm just doing it in a judgmental way that I'm smarter than everybody else. (laughs) Is now you were? uh, This is all new to me. Some of this Q stuff. Like I know what Q is, obviously, but I got my Q from the Donald subreddit. 
Um, and it wasn't because I was a supporter of Donald. This is a, the weird, the weird way that I even like understood and uh, got into Q at all was because the Orlando shooting, right? The Orlando shooting happened. And I remember going to Reddit and a bunch of the other uh, places online to get like the most up to date info because CNN and MSNBC. Is it just and me R- or was that the gayest shooting? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> God. Sorry, just kidding. Where, where? <laughs> uh, too soon. <laughs> they, they, uh, I don't know. They I, yeah, take, they let me take like, the pulse of the room. No pun so intended. Too, oh God! You can't, and I'm in Orlando. It's like hate speech to say that. But I remember that, like, as it was happening. Like we knew it was happening and I'm like, well, there's got to be a place online where I can go and get like the most live up to date updates about like what the hell is going on about all this. And I w- remember seeing in real time uh, all of these different forums just getting taken down. There would be like a, a Reddit thread in the news, right? In the Orlando subreddit, all these different subreddits and everyone's talking about it. And then it gets like consolidated into like one of those Reddit threads where here's where all the information goes to. And in there, it was just like, here's the link to Fox. Here's the link to CNN. We're not going to speculate. And I'm like, the hell we aren't. We're on the internet. This is the <laughs> entire point. I'm on Reddit is for the speculation and for all of like the up to date updates that don't go through all the extra filters. And the only place I could find was this weird freaking subreddit called the Donald. I was like, who the hell is Donald? You know, like, I'm thinking Donald Duck or something. And I click on there and immediately it's just all God Emperor this and like, you know, TikTok. Um, like the the QAnon TikTok, like we're waiting, you know, like the other shoe's gonna drop, and that's where the uh, the Orlando shooting information was at. Like all the latest, ever, like all the speculation, news reports, and people linking to where you could listen to the live uh, police radars, at least the ones that weren't uh, completely obfuscated. You know what I mean? So like oh, this guy, I'm not gonna be able to kill. He's gonna kill us. Um, so like all this is going on. And I remember like, oh, I guess this is the place I go to when stuff happens. And then sure enough, not long after that was the uh, the Paris shooting, right? Where it was in the theater and exactly the same thing happens. I go to like all the, the Ariana Grande right? concert. No, no, no. Th- this one was in Paris. Like, actually, okay. I think it was in it was nine, nine in, or seven, seven. Uh, well, seven, seven was the tube explosions i think in the uk okay. i don't it was one of those numbers but yeah it's uh, the paris shooting where it was just a bunch of guys shooting into a, a barrel of fish essentially because there was no one with guns so they just had free reign for like an hour and again the freaking donald subreddit is the only place that had any sort of information that wasn't coming directly from the four hour you know like delayed filtered news feed so because holy shit i just ran right into him again uh, because of that i was like man i guess now i go to the donald whenever i want to get some sort of like unfiltered information and then it just kind of becomes like a news source and i realize at a certain point like oh this is the normie version of wherever they're getting like all this other information from and that information was basically q so like or whoever the hell was pretending to be q or whatever right so that essentially was like my introduction to Q was, oh, this is the place where I find out who's actually doing the shooting at in Orlando, who actually killed all those people uh, in Paris. And I guess Aria Grande, the same exact thing with the Las Vegas shooting. And when the Las Vegas shooting happened, I just went right to the Donald. I was like, this is where I'm going to get <laughs> the information. And that's where it was like, oh, check it out. Here's an audio feed of a 50 caliber uh, rifle next to an M16. Listen to how long it is between the different blasts. Oh wow, it sounds a lot closer to that 50 caliber than it does to this, uh, either like a 762 or or anyway like the 223 or the 556. Like it's much closer to this 50 cal. And again, I was like, man, this is the only place that I, I would be able to read this. And I was right. And then they took that down, and then that became a gone thing. And th- this none of that's an endorsement of Donald Trump, but of like whatever they were doing, whoever was filtering and putting that information out there, maybe I got, maybe it wasn't a shooting at all. And I just got like wound up out of all that. But that, I guess that's the closest that I came to Q was getting information from the Donald subreddit. So there we go. I've, I've exposed myself. I really just 
um, got obsessed with, uh, it's where I started to use, my father um, was a Latin professor and it's where I started to use the, like where MAGA was witch in Latin to me. It was like- You already know that before all the memes? It, like right when, oh, I feel like I'm the one who started it. And that's where <laughs> <laughs> I was like, when I first saw it, it did something to me. Like, I felt like it was the universe clapping its hands and saying like, wake up to your magic, which like, I just felt like it was directly to me. It had nothing to do with him because I was triggered by him. I already tore him up like part. Like he was my JFK junior. I'm from Palm beach. So it's like the amount the Donald has been around me my whole life. And like in my zeitgeist, he might as well have been a character that the universe put there for me that like a mirror that said, as long as this, which he would have been my least favorite customer. Like I've been in the service industry for a long time. I've been a marketer. This guy would have been my like, Oh my gosh. He would have gotten it for free. He would have complained and gotten it for free. That's the kind of he would have that he is. come in the room. Like it would have been quiet, nice violin music playing. And he would have been like my favorite server. I want Chaney. She's <laughs> the best. And it would have been like this whole scene. And he'd be like, she knows I'm a good tip. And he'd tell everyone how much money he gave me and like the palm you'd see where everyone would know, like, he'd be like, I hope that helps with your bills. Like, thank you, sir. Like, I'd have to be subservient. Uh, Maybe you won't be so damn poor now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> silly pores. Like, <laughs> silly gay poor. She just needs a man in her life. <laughs> <laughs> Cheney, she's my favorite lesbian. Like, <laughs> don't like, follow into the dressing room. Yeah, he would have been my least fave. And I felt like the universe really put him here. So the universe said to me, Cheney, like God, Jesus, Buddha, whatever. It, it said it, Cheney, as long as this prick does not put on a mask, you don't put on a mask. If this guy doesn't get a swab, you're not getting a swab. He ain't better than you. He ain't better. It was like a constant, like a little bit of my ego looking at this rich white man, which everything in my upbringing tried to make me a feminist bookstore owner. <laughs> like everything. It, it was like, it was here's Portlandia all. Cheney. I, yeah, I kind of would like to see that version of Cheney. It totally wanted. It was like, she's going to have chickens and she's going to be a man hater. And she's a VW bus with like um, coexist sticker on it. Like the whole thing. And um, like, Oh, you guys, we just have to love. It's okay. Like medicine for your kids. Sure. Get trans agenda. Like they tried to create that out of me. So looking at Donald Trump, he was supposed to be my nemesis, but instead he became my mirror. Like, well, if that guy's not doing it, I'm not doing it either. Whatever that guy does, I do. And so it just was like a different, like I needed to see myself bigly. <laughs> like I needed to have a little bit of Trump energy myself. It had nothing to do with that, homie. It, and that's kind of what I feel like he represents a little bit. Everybody that's like, stop waiting for a savior. Look in the mirror and tell yourself that. Like most of the people I know involved in the Q movement literally are at their, their student councils and their city councils and they're running for offices and they're getting the poison out of shit and they're opening their loud mouths and they're raising their kids homeschooled and they're doing all the sacrifices to like put their money where their mouth is. Like most of the people I know that actually voted for Donald Trump and they're also in church with a real savior, like somebody who they consider is an actual savior, that the idea of somebody in the in internet world saying you don't think donald's your savior no nope, that's you you're projecting like you're projecting you're waiting you want your country to either go to full anarchy so you can talk about it or like you're not going to do anything about it though like you've pretty much proven what you're gonna do but most of the people that don't have to do anything because i see the black pills if you have a big black pill you live in a shitty place like you're drinking sludge if you're like eh, I'm watching a t TV show and life is what it is. And I'm just trying to figure out this great big world that I do think that there's a power structure that hides secrets from us. And I'm not going to partake. I'm just going to observe. You probably live in Florida. <laughs> 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 I've realized there's so many bitter people that they're sitting in a Chicago, you know, high rise or in their mom's basement in Portland. And they're like, I hate Cheney and paranoid American for living in Florida. But I'm going to say it's because Cheney's grandfather was a Mason. <laughs> you just hate us for our Florida. 
I know so many Canadians. I'm like, I've met more Canadian men that live in Mexico or live in some other country that have literally ran from Canada. And then they talk shit about America. And I'm just like, oh, a Florida girl has no place for a Canadian who's ran from their land. Like, I have no place. Like, I I feel like in my masculine, my pinky finger is more masculine than anyone who's run. And you grew up under a queen your whole entire life. And then Trudeau, (laughs) you literally are a do nothing. You're never going to do anything. Like, I just, there's something about a runner that I'm just like, (laughs) you like the simulation scared you enough on TV for you to pick up and run. But if you live in a rat cage, then you're overcoming like, huh, I don't think humans are supposed to need electricity to pump water. Maybe I'm blackpilled for a reason and it's not Cheney telling me that my city shit. <laughs> you have an idea what the next iteration of Q is going to be? Because I mean, with the election ramping up, it seems like either there's some sort of real Q movement whether that was like spawned from a fake one but it feels like there's a like there's a real group of people behind it but then there's also clearly the fabricated Hegelian dialectic version that's being like made and and for them to say okay turn on the camera now and then they say action and then you know the guy with the freaking buffalo hat comes out and does the thing right buffalo dildo pretty much if you see him anywhere just, yeah, he he got me one of my strikes on YouTube, funny enough. You know, it's kind of funny. I um Ben Balderson, shout out to Ben, um Odin's Alchemy. He was ben on Balls, I got a quick shout out to Ben. He said that the he was comparing Box Saga to oh Dr. Seuss, and I lost it. Juan said it to me. He was like, Oh, the boogly doos and the doogly doos and the woogly woos. <laughs> this is I love Ben. And Ben, he does he doesn't give a book. He has love, his I Ben. I love him, and I feel like in a way for real, the C CIA, they watch Ben's channel and they listen to my words and they were like, hmm, how can we do this? Because really me and Ben are not supposed to be friends in the zeitgeist and he's one of my favorite people out there. But the, everything that the the TV tried to create for us, we weren't supposed to be friends. And so I believe they were like, let's take this bitch's words and let's wrap it up in this guy's look and put Buffalo horns on him. And that is the QAnon shaman from the CIA. I think me and Ben put together is the Q shaman. So <laughs> <laughs> I think he, even he has an Odin's tattoo on his chest to sh- let you know, like, Hey, you guys look, I'm part Ben here. And I have a big pawn here. Cause five D chess, like Cheney, <laughs> like he's even showing you in his characters, like I'm Ben and Cheney. And so I just think everything, this guy is so low hanging fruit. He's in all these rooms on X. Anyone who he has like a hundred thousand followers. And he, he's such a shill in such a way of like mixing everything together. So I think they're, that's part of the realism to like technology slowly walk you into the X zeitgeist of the everything app. These certain characters that were put there, like I think they take my Maria and they absorb it. And then they're like, let's sell this narrative, but we're going to call this person Lala Bean. (laughs) (laughs) And like, it's just CIA, like who runs the world? who runs the world, making little things of real authentic people that are attached to source and that believe truth and do all this. And they're like, that's why I think my character a little bit, they're like, shit, she dyed her hair back blonde. We can't put Ellen back on the zeitgeist. (laughs) They're like, she's, we need to get her dancing. If we could just get Cheney to dance more and like, Sling some koosh balls at an audience. That's all lesbians are allowed to do. I mean, you, you are on TikTok now, so you are inching towards the the dancing Cheney era, right? Rachel Madcow. Like, I'm just gonna come on, Rachel Maddow. I'm gonna do a celebrity boxing match, but I'm gonna start calling out these dykes. <laughs> Honestly, I think that would that is one of the coolest ideas I've heard. If if you just like start calling 
out celebrity like like lesbian celebrities and just like i'll fight you i'm willing to fight you at this day at this time and if you don't i don't know like, like, like i will totally Paul this Hoover. is i just realized a few weeks ago when healing all up i was like i'm gonna get into jujitsu i'm so excited all oh, my buddy my buddy does jujitsu i'm so turned on by it by the ufc i can't wait i know so much about rolling can't wait can't wait can't wait i went to a jujitsu tournament and i was like hmm to what end for your age? To what end for your age? You are not a man. You are not young. You are not going to join the UFC. What do you need this skill set for? Like where the juice is worth the squeeze of hurting yourself. You maybe need to go to the, if it's protection, go to the shooting range. If it's athleticism and working out, you could figure out ways that are easier on your body. So in my next <laughs> head, I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to box instead. <laughs> Like one of my guys at work, he's a good boxer. And I'm like, you know, I used to date a boxer when I was younger. And it really like he taught me how to like punch with my left as well as my right, which really changed the game. And I would totally start calling out like Rachel Maddow seems like an easy first. But even like call her daddy, like any of the ones involved in the pizza bar stool sports network um any comedians joe rogan has on like i'll fight both those girls at the same time like i'll just any i'll just start calling out the broads in ways that and not passive aggressively like no no i i want i'm thinking like wwf like ultimate warrior calling out hulk hogan or like randy savage calling someone out like like, oh my gosh i have a belt like I actually have a belt that I, like I I'll, this is a thing. I mean, I'm just telling you, I don't I don't do a lot of TikTok and retweeting. I should. I should share more. But I swear if I saw someone doing like a WWF like 80s style call out of like Leah Re- Remini or like anyone else you can think of like oh like, Leah Remini with your fake Scientology <laughs> outing and like pacing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm into it. I but I need I think a witch maga hat. Like I need a oh, witch hat that's red that says maga on it for part of my character because the lean in of why we need to fist fight is I can feel you trying to do astral battles with me. <laughs> like Could I have to a, lean in. Would a Q hat work? Could it be like a wizard hat with like the Q on it, or is that is that too much of a specific thing? The whole um no sometimes i'll just be like right on cue like i'll throw the cue around i'll be like oh 17 tells me today that where we go when we go all <laughs> i mean almost thinking like if we had a nice little hat you could just have like a letter on different sides and and like spin oh, it around okay. when you wanted to get into cue mode or get into maga mode i would do it half and half and then dye my hair half and half too <laughs> <laughs> so I could just twist it around and then become different characters. I'm into it. I could call out Hillary and Huma. I'll be like, oh, Nancy Pelosi, you bring those big old tits over here. <laughs> I'm on board for this. If you, need, you need any help with the like the promotion aspect, the soundtrack, a video, like I'm all on board on this one. I need a whole outfit. I need to lean in and just like I think this is my TikTok, and then I just call them out for their crimes. Like Hillary Clinton, you think you can get up in Haiti and get one over on me? <laughs> I had a speaking of like these like viral and and catering to the algorithm a little bit. I've been brainstorming on another idea. I want to get your feedback on this one, but. Uh, and and this is I, I can't remember who I was talking to there's another animator that was like I love your work and would love to collaborate I will, absolutely if anyone that does animation wants to collaborate just hit me up I'm down already but an idea that I've been brainstorming is 10 second conspiracies which is not a completely original idea because they had like like 10 second movie reviews back in like the early 2000s and I really liked them they were they were a little bit ahead of their time this is like a vine thing and someone would just be like, here's a breakdown of the movie. And sometimes they would just reenact like the biggest parts of the movie within 10 seconds. Or maybe it was like three seconds or seven. I remember the nine. It was like essentially under 10 seconds. And what about just a series of 10 second conspiracies? Like here's a 10 second breakdown of the JFK assassination. 
from the mafia did it. Okay, now here's a 10 second version of the CIA did it. Now here's a 10 second version of the official story, or maybe, I don't know, five second versions or something, but it would be a, an interesting way to not have to get tied down into one specific subject, but also touch like every different conspiracy theory. And in these like little, I don't know if that would be like you a viral thing or TikTok people like it. Because they have like 15 second, 30 second, one minute and 10 minute, I think. So you could actually do 15 second conspiracies cool. and be like JFK assassination. It wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. There was probably somebody in the sewer and it was the blah, blah, blah. And you just fucking try to get out as many words as you can in 15 Micro seconds. Machine and it, style. <laughs> yeah. And it cut off with you still talking every time. <laughs> and they like never them. finish. They never finish. And exactly like the micro machine guy. Like you should just take that commercial and make it you. And even if you have backgrounds instead of little micro machines, like you know, you could even hold up your Lego heads, <laughs> like little conspiracies, and then you just tout off a whole bunch of shit and never finish it and go into the next one. I wonder if there's like a uh, <laughs> what's this, something about Mary where the guy's like he's making a five minute abs and then the guy is like, well, what if someone makes, you know, three minute abs? And he's like, no, no one can make the three minute abs. <laughs> I, I'm wondering on this, like, what if you do the 15 second conspiracy and then someone comes out with like the seven second conspiracy and then someone comes out with a five second? I wonder, like, what is the shortest amount of time that you could have to convey to a normie? Um, like just a little tidbit to get them interested, but also to the hardcore conspiracy theorists that they s listen all five seconds, they'd be like, damn, that was actually a lot of info for those five seconds. They got a lot of that right. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is it five? Is it seven? Is it 15? What is it? I think it would be cool if you did it and did it five or seven or whatever, or you did it like three um, point three two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you figured out whatever the thing was to do, but also it would be a segment on your show. So you could have all your guests where you were just like maybe three topics, any random ones that you feel like. So that way you would drop some that would be on Paranoid American and then you would have some that they dropped and it was like edited the same way. I like this. Uh, I think that there's might be something to this. It's almost like it you know how people say an elevator speech. You only get one floor. It's not an elevator speech. Like we're not going up 47 floors. You get one floor to tell me the conspiracy. And so one it would floor so is not a lot of time, especially if it's a fast elevator. Yep. So I just think it's like, boom, you start the button and end it. Boom, doors open or whatever the thing would be at the. <laughs> it's like, uh, okay, you're about to die and you have your last breath. <laughs> It is about this seconds long. You are trying to relate to me the one conspiracy that would save the world, and that's this. So the other big thing that happened this week was the comic convention. I wanted to just thank you because I think like the night before, like a couple days before, you started dropping all these really good ideas on me and I acted on as many of them as I could. One of the biggest ones, which sounds like a minor thing, but the freaking table risers, you have no idea how many people actually stopped and were like, Oh wow. What a great idea. And some uh, more than one person was like, I like that your stuff is eye level. Like they didn't say that the, you know, I didn't have to bend down or anything, but just like, oh wow, I like that this stuff is eye level. And there were people that were running other tables. They were like, man, I've been to 50 of these and I've never seen someone do this before. What a great idea. And I was just like, yeah, I thought of this myself. I'm a genius. But really, <laughs> it was it was you, but it wasn't even you, right? It was it was your little helper. But I appreciate that because that really stood out. Um, I don't know what else I can do better. I think a lot of things I can do better. I feel like I, I did like a three out of 10. I think Some I of the stuff I didn't, because you were going in the next two days, it couldn't change. And so right. there were some things that I had to give you, but I have learned in life that you can give somebody information at the wrong time and it crushes them. And so, okay. so what was the stuff that might've crushed now that it's over now that it's what? over yeah. <laughs> black <laughs> isn't a good color. You think black's a good color because then you think your product sticks out more, but you have to think of your thing from very far away and why they want to come to you. And so the black, isn't the the color you want your um 
it to stick out a little bit. So sometimes the tablecloth on tablecloth where you get a little smaller tablecloth, but maybe you have a red one underneath it or a patterned one underneath it. And then you lay your tablecloth over it. So it borders it. Um, these are like little ideas. Also, a like neon box. green, is that off the table? Or no, you can do whatever you want to lean okay. into that, like, uh, and it could change all the time. Um, the pr- having pricing on all your products is awesome. And that is what like separating it all and not having the written board at all. So because people don't want to talk, sometimes you're a deter to people <laughs> wanting to just browse and see what they want to grab. And I don't think all your price points were wrong. I just think you need more expensive items to make the cheaper items look like they're cheaper. So even though you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to, I would need to sell something that was $250. Maybe you have a couple projects that you work on that are a little next level that you don't necessarily need to sell. But if you sell any one of them, it pays for the whole thing. Um, Another weird one, sometimes things like, the comic cons and the their unproven markets they tell you we're going to have this many feet on the ground we're going to have this many things going on but they're unproven and sometimes the farmers markets that are in your town that are every single sunday those are the money bags and so where you are like okay you know what i'm going to sign up i'm going to give myself three sundays where i show up because it's not the first time they see you they know you're there and then they're like, oh my gosh, I have to get a gift for so-and-so. I'll go to that farmer's market to get my mushrooms and then you're there. And so it's the one that you become a little storefront for them. Where you, How did even you know I was also selling mushrooms? That's not what <laughs> I'm to close on here. Out of, of all the things with the business of markets and all the ones that, um, and my wife you know, had the soap company and a bath and body work company. It was the regular market that she became her own kind of storefront at that place. And that really overall, the percentage way more money than the ones that cost her like oh it's going to be this concert we're going to have five thousand people here and they never do it's like not proven they but if it's like we're going to have this jazz fest and we're going to have ten thousand people here that jazz fest usually is proven proven it's been in that town or at that fairgrounds those are the ones you want to do even though it seems like i'm going to lean into comic book people because they're going to be there to do that no there's going to be comic book people out and about at every one of these markets and then you're the only dude with the comics you're not competing next to all these other dudes with comics that's how you let the comic industry know you're there but not the people that's i mean you've you didn't even have to go and you already knew this and i think i knew this going into because i mean it's my first convention I've ever been to, but I've been doing comics for over 10 years now. And I already kind of had this, uh, this notion of like the comic conventions and the comic book industry isn't really where I'm going to get readers from because a, they're probably really big into like superhero stuff more likely than not. If they're like big in the Marvel and DC, they might not really even be anywhere near my demographic. I actually do way better with people that like conspiracy theories and they're like, Oh, I've never seen this research presented in this format. How interesting. That's kind of my bread and butter. And when it gets into the comic book world, it's sort of the opposite. It's like, Oh, this isn't what I was expecting or this isn't, you know, and outside the politics, once they realize that I'm like pro adrenochrome, right. They're like, Oh, this, this idiot, you know, we need to get him out of this market. But the other big aspect of this is that at like the comic convention in particular, so many people were there as resellers. Like they don't care about, they're not going to read a single thing they're buying. They're trying to find a thing that they saw on eBay that went for 80 and see if they can talk the guy down to 60 and just repeat that process and go to all the tables and then repeat that with used Nintendo games and Funko pop characters and uh, Pokemon cards. They're like, honestly at the, at the comic book convention, the number one sellers were Pokemon cards and Funko pops. And and people were buying like, you know, sealed packs and buying sealed Funko Pops and making sure they bought the box that had the least scuffs on it because they're all going to put it back on eBay or resell it on whatnot. And I kind of realized that I was like, OK, yeah, this is just reconfirming that this isn't necessarily where I go to find readers, but it's definitely where I go to be noticed by the other independent comic book guys. So then they give me the inside scoop on like, oh, go to this. Uh, convention they're doing better here and like that's kind of how you get into that little inside circuit 
and you wouldn't get into that inside circuit without showing up to these conventions just like you're talking about the the farmers markets the farmers markets you get all the civilians and all the consumers and they're like oh i remember him you know it's familiar i'm not gonna feel like i'm just gonna walk up to some stranger now even though if we're total strangers and they never introduced it you walk by it three or four times and i can see that at the convention people like half of them are walking by and getting an inventory how much money do i want to spend but some of them were literally like working up the nerve to like go up to that scary conspiracy booth that had you know the the frazzle drip comic on it and i guess that's another thing i learned too is that i've got this whole table and a big rack of comics but in order to take a look at one of the comics you'd actually have to like physically remove it from the rack and then like things were kind of squished in there so i i already knew because i saw people that like wanted to take it but maybe they just were nervous or anxious or just didn't want to like actively rearrange stuff on the table and if i had just had a book laid out like already ready to go where it didn't feel like they might knock something over that could have done wonders for me and, and i mean i i saw it in real time but it was also like there's no freaking space on this table to do the things that i wanted to do and that is like even with their they realized oh we have to have product that people can touch and feel that is not for sale. Like people want to touch and feel the thing. It doesn't matter if it's a sticker. It doesn't matter if it's a loofah. It doesn't matter if it's a bar of soap. They want to touch it and feel it and smell it. People, it's like our first. And so when they can touch all and feel and, and then you grab a brand new one from behind you and hand it to them, that is, they're like, oh, mm. like think of merch tables at concerts too. Like where sometimes the other thing I'm like, oh, Thomas needs this as well. You have so many great designs. People will buy T-shirts and you don't want to make a bazillion of them. I but know, might- man, I just I hate I hate T-shirts so much because I work in a T-shirt shop and I like I did it for a little while and I've got nightmares of having a room that I couldn't use full of like smalls and mediums. And like four XLs of crap. I know that that's will never sell ever. It, it's it's like t-shirts are the hardest because of like the sizing, but that is where it's like okay, if you don't want to do t-shirts, you have to think of what can you do one size fits all. So socks or hats or like something that they because people or stuffed animals like you were saying those pop up things people will also buy a shit for their kids or they want to hold it and feel it like everyone still goes to a concert and they still want that t-shirt and if nobody else is selling that t-shirt you have the t-shirt it's like even if it's of the day this is where i think it's so specific even like um the chaos twins signing coming up you need chaos twins shirts like people want the day of the thing and they want things sometimes that they can only get there so oh, you are like- so right actually right after we're done talking i'm gonna have to go and order a bunch of i'm, <laughs> I'm an idiot because i didn't even consider that until you just said it. of course people are gonna want to buy a freaking chaos twin shirt live at the sam tripoli uh two shows on march 30th uh you know here in where's it gonna be it's gonna be somewhere in ocala a place called joke joint i believe so yeah, if anyone's joint, watching yeah. and you want to see a live show with sam tripoli are you gonna show up i am Janie's gonna be there live uh i think the nephilim death squad are gonna be there live uh i it sounded like juan might not make it um because he's a little bit he's so responsible no he's just a little bitch <laughs> you, know, you know what it is 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 he does better when there's not a lot of competition like he'll do well around me because i'm still like learning but if he's around you or sam tripoli or like some actual experts or, like all his flaws are just so damn apparent so i think that he shies away from when there's like an actual juxtaposition that can show all those flaws you know, what's kind of funny too, is like, I think I'm finding it more often than not is that just because people are on microphone doesn't mean they're great around people. Like it just it, like, I'm kind of shy until I know you. And that's why it's like, no, I, on this pre- platform now, I feel like I know it and I know my audience or there's enough of them in the room always, or like even hanging out with you guys. It's like, I know you guys, it's comfortable to me, but there's sometimes in IRL where um, I am just so, or I get myself really stoned or sometimes I'm like, Oh, do I have a resting bitch face? Like I get all in my head about things that I'm like, when it's a crowd of people, 
that um, I've done now a couple meetups and I've seen Sam with a crowd of people where the world knew about it. And I see him where I haven't told anyone and I just got to hang out with Sam. And so um, all of you guys, now I know you and uh, the Nephilim death squad. I feel I'm kind of excited (laughs) because I feel like they'll bring out my naughtiest asshole. (laughs) Like there's something about their sense of humor that reminds me of like, when me and my guy friends are like hanging out and it's two o'clock in the morning and there's no holds barred anymore. Like there's not a, it, all the words can flow. There isn't cuss words. No one's soft, whatever your race is. Or like one of my guy friends will be like, Chaney, you got sand in your pers- pussy, you fucking dyke. Like, it's like that kind of talk. Like there is no holds barred. It reminds right. me in a way, and there's there's a gay aspect to it, but like in a, in the military, there was this this concept of like gay chicken, which sounds exact, and everyone's probably come across, but like it was a serious sport in the military. Like not like, I, I cannot understate how serious it was taken. Like it was a whole different sport, better, bigger than fantasy football by a large margin, right? But I feel like there's an aspect of Nephilim Death Squad that's not gay chicken, but it's like offensive chicken. Like how far can I push something that I don't necessarily believe, but say it in a way that it makes it sound like I believe it and then keep pushing it and maybe keep it up for a year or two or three. Like that's kind of the vibe that I get. And it it is like that naughty, you know, like we might get in trouble if mom hears us saying this, but I love that because sometimes that's where like, um, not like when you're getting drunk and like the truth comes out, but it's like when you're joking, the truth comes out, but it's not the whole, th- I, I'm, I'm not necessarily a poet in this exact regard, but I'm just thinking like the joke lets you be facetious, but also not be facetious. So you can kind of say some things that are on your mind in like a highly offensive way so that the offense takes like priority over the point that you're making, but it makes it so that like the point, is driven in so like it's almost an nlp tactic right where like you're anchoring in this like trauma of like oh my god do you really this is my mom right do you really believe that but then there's like a little nugget that gets like stuck in there outside of the offensive part i don't know i don't know if i'm explaining that properly no i totally and it's also like the leaning in i feel like girls we do this thing with our magic and I think we do it in our households and I think we do it at our jobs. And I think even in the conspiracy realm, I find that I'm pretty good at this magic. You might think you don't agree with me, but three questions from now, you just let the audience know you don't agree with yourself. (laughs) Like I have this like way of like, huh? So what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And what do you think of, okay, curious. And then I'd move on from it. We didn't get into a debate about it. It's like a whole different tactic, like that women kind of do sometimes. But men, when it's full frontal sometimes of like, eh, just get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. Like it, there's some kind <laughs> of like amazingness about guys getting to be full guys and girls, instead of getting offended by it and calling it locker room talk, you're witnessing their magic. And it's so funny and it's so awesome. And guys that lean into it, I'm, I've gotten to experience it in my life because I am lucky enough to have like real guy friends that I believe they let their wall down that they usually keep up around other women around me. So we'll watch fights late night, late nights. I don't care if they itch their balls. I don't care if they're drunk. Like I've seen them literally pass all the way out where I was like, <laughs> like I've seen the craziest shit with them. And so, but there is this like beauty of of how much they truly love each other that they can hit each other in their biggest insecurities and it doesn't hurt in that room. It, I can't explain how I wish women were the same way where you could be like, bitch, will you bring me a coffee in there looking all fat in them jeans today? <laughs> <laughs> like, I wish girls could <laughs> say this kind of weird shit to each other that guys, it's almost like hitting each other in the balls. Like it's like, which is stunning. also not gay. You just got to stress. <laughs> it is not gay to touch another guy on his genitals. As long as you're intending to cause pain, it's not gay, <laughs> which is weird. It's like a weird rule. I almost wish girls could be this kind of full. Like, I don't know. I, I always try to say the thing I am, but my, uh, I had an MMA, uh, 
podcast back when, and it was called Lesbo and the Bean. And we just leaned into the things we already knew. People were wanted to call us Dyke and the Spick, but that might get pulled off. So we were like, let's just lean into Lesbo and the Bean. So anything that they're going to say to debate with us is already there. Like, there's not any spot you're really going to hit us. Yep. He's like, and we kind of the no effects, uh, white trash two weeks. I was in a literally bean. just about to say, yeah, this is the uh, this is the white uh, the no effects album. <laughs> yeah, the, I was like, I, pretty much since I've been podcasting, I always wanted to lean into some sort of punk rock idea of what everybody thought we had to do, and maybe it's the Howard Stern to Joe Rogan to then oh. We don't have to do it like that. And there's guidelines like we have to play by these guidelines to stay on YouTube or IG or Facebook or whatever. But after you lose so many accounts and then enough of the people always find you again. And then when you didn't start out doing it for money and you never paid your bills to do it, it hurts sometimes when you lose content. But now I've gotten smarter. So I save my conversations. And if the Internet steals them, I eventually can put them up somewhere. But um I don't know. Is that the biggest? <laughs> is that the biggest blow? Is that if you get something taken down, losing the content? What What else is like a? I've only had a few channels taken down so far, and they've all been taken down when I didn't get that big. But I know a lot of people; they'll get to like a hundred thousand followers or more, and that gets taken down. And like, I don't even know. I don't know how I would react to that because it hasn't happened to me. I in the Anon days, it really sucked because nobody knew who you were and you didn't know who they were. And so when your account was taken, you didn't like, I've literally met people in the last year on X again, that we were friends four years ago under whole different, like they were like, Oh my gosh, you were conspiracy chicken. Like it, like those kind of, (laughs) yeah. So it's like those kind of things that, um, that was sad because we used to have hashtags. This was another part of the Q kids that they don't get credit for because the internet took it down. And then Joe Rogan spouts it off to you or some CIA, you know, reject touts it off to you and acts like it's their idea. But really back when we were all anonymous. So taking credit for an idea didn't mean anything. So we had hashtags and the goal was to share our ideas so we could all dig together and attach to the idea. So if normies ever clicked the hashtag that said blank, 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 um, it pulled up all my research, all paranoid Americans research, all one-on-ones research, and it would all be under this. And then if you saw, like, let's say it started out to Taria, you might have one that said mud floods and one might have one that said ancient antiquitech and I might have one. And then you would click those and everybody's stuff was all together. When the internet took all of our podcasts down and started deleting all of our stuff, they took all of our hashtags too. So you can't find all of the Wayfair research we did. You can't find all of the cube posts, the WW, where we go when we go all. You can't find all of the EO executive orders that Trump signed that were like, oh, look it. Have, has anyone read the wartime manual? Has anyone read that? Like we're all under these wartime manuals still. We never got out of this. And so like, this is where all of the attachments, when people are like, where's your proof? This didn't happen or that didn't happen. No, they let through the clock that had the queue that's probably still on X every other day that's counting down until something big is going to happen or some big account um, that they made sure HBO told you about that. Hey, just so you know, this reporter is a Q reporter and everyone follows her online. Um, th- the media made sure you knew who the head of what you think is the movement. But all the people that were really doing the movement were a bunch of anon ants. And it was never about Cheney getting credit. It was that all of our information attached. So if you click this one hashtag on Cheney, it's going to open up nine slides on my Maria where she explains it better. And then that might give you a link to Paranoid American. We're going to find comic books about it. It wasn't ever about... It was always about us just getting the information out there, but the internet made it so we couldn't do that. They took away all of our hashtags and no hashtags. I don't care if it's flat earth. I don't care if it's 9-11's an inside job. I don't care if it's D. Lane Maxwell or Epstein didn't kill himself. The hashtags you can't find are all the Q hashtags. And still to this day, 
They're all deleted. I know more Q kids that can't get on X or can't get an Instagram account or can't get a Facebook account than anyone else out there. Nobody is shadow banned like the Anon kids. Nobody's lost accounts at 250,000 that wasn't these kids. So it's what, curious. Why do you think that is in particular? Is it is it because they're onto something or is it because that's just like what you do to the Q crowd? I think there has never been from the January 6th all the way to the Q documentaries on CNN, the Q documentaries on HBO, the um, Mother God documentary on HBO. They are so desperate to try to get in front of it of something they can't get in front of because the more the internet opens up and the more like X is becoming a truer and truer example of a silent majority. Nobody like all the Trump crowd still there. Watch any of his speeches, watch any of his things. (laughs) Well, true social as well. But I believe if true social wasn't a chess move that was played, we would never hear one word from Donald Trump. The media wouldn't talk about him. Well, the, he would just I know mean, his house was raided. back on Twitter, right? Ever since uh, Elon bought Elon it. Elon took but, over. But Trump yeah. was basically like, I've already invested everything in this truth. Why the hell am I going to bring my people over to you? Like, you're the competition now. No, he has a no compete clause. I believe he doesn't trust X. I just believe it's like his, as long as I keep my newspaper here, I don't need... Trump's megaphone only needs to reach. He knows now he has enough Q kids on truth that his megaphone only needs to hit them. It becomes like the original Anon thing that we did in Wall Street. I said it. Then you 10 people said it after me. Then the crowd heard it. You remember how we played megaphone? So we yeah, didn't. It. Check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's really the it, all true social is, is the center of the mic check. And so he knows enough kids are on there. Whatever he says, whatever he posts, whatever direction he sends, they're going to all bring it to X and Facebook and things and whatever. But it's really when people are like, oh, two wings of the same bird. The two wings have nothing to do with Trump. They both hate him. <laughs> Nikki Haley, look how long she desperately stayed in that thing, trying to get, ignite women against Trump. Look at DeSantis. They thought he was going to be the golden boy. I really believe like Hillary's second term, we're supposed to have the DeSantis Newsome battle right now in front of us. And everybody was supposed to just eat that right up. Newsom saved California and uh, DeSantis slave Florida. And those were going to be your separate sides for secession. And no one's even buying into secession. No one bought into monkeypox. Disease X, they keep the only people talking about disease X are the conspiracy theorists that are trying to get you to take a black pill. They're going to mask us up again. Oh, the, the only people that are scared of that are the fucking dudes that masked up the first time. <laughs> Like, what are they going to do? They're going to roll the UN tank down my street. I have been begging for this for years, like begging. Like you want to see some monkeys with guns? You want to see Planet of the Apes? Roll you in on a Florida shore and watch how quickly you see bloods, crips and rednecks (laughs) all come together. <laughs> like, wrong. I mean, F- Florida would be one of those places, like like the ultimate melting pot, where people that you don't think are going to work together end up working together in really strange ways. The Cubans in Florida had t- Her- got hurricane. on a raft and sailed over to get away from communism. Grandmas, grandpas, they came over here and they have fire inside of them against communism that is bigger than any American you will ever meet. Part of the reason that Florida is so anti-communism is because of the Cuban blood that's been spilled here. Like, it, there, it's a and a lot of uh, Catholics, lots and lots of Catholics from uh, all the different sort of like Latin um, derivatives. Like, like a lot of that has more traditional like Christian and Catholic values than people that profess to be like Catholic and Christian. Um, and this, like, yeah, yeah, dude. But and but like the fact that there's so many, it's like, oh, you're on our side, and then they start like bashing, you know, like Christianity, and then they lose. A part of the demographic like what well, wait what did we say you know we're just saying our thoughts and because it's it doesn't fit into like these perfect little things and i think for a lot of people i guess like you were brought up the the greek orthodox stuff right like 
the Christianity angle, that's the hill that people are literally willing to die on. Like a lot of people like, oh, you know, you won't be a single issue on this or that. When it comes to religion, and in, I guess maybe in my mind, like guns, religion and guns are these like single issues that maybe are worth a little bit of attention. Like if there is someone that's against religion, you might just be like, well, then the enemy of my enemy is my friend in this can in this one, you know, situation and other things you might not care passionately about. Maybe you don't side with somebody, but when it comes to like, again, like the religion angle, it's like, well, fine, I'll go with the guy that's not trying to get rid of God. You know what I mean? Like, which makes sense if you don't believe in God or if you're agnostic, maybe it doesn't. But if someone's like, I want to remove your God, they'll be like, man, even if it's like the Antichrist, they'll go towards it. Because at least the Antichrist relies on God to exist. I don't know. The Elon to me is the most dangerous character on the game board, way over the Trump. I almost think um, the politics mean nothing if they can privatize. Like that's it. And so the George Floyd thing in Minnesota and right on their ballot that next year was we should privatize the police department. And this is where I think the two wings of the same bird where people don't pay attention is like why one side's fighting against guns. The other guys tell it, the other side's telling you it's all mental illness and SSRIs, but really both sides are asking you for the government to be involved and who's telling you is crazy and who telling you should have a gun. We don't want that at all. You don't want the government ever involved in the thing. So I feel like, um, part of the Elon is if you can get a majority of people, oh my gosh, there's going to be a blackout. Look at all the rolling blackout, solar flares, hacking. Kanye tweets out, my iPhone's been acting weird, but guess what didn't fall when all this other stuff keeps having problems? X, who's shooting up satellites in your system, in your sky every single day? Elon yeah. Musk. He wants to put a neural link in your head. If any way that Terminator, that literally a guy named Arnold black nigger that is literally the translation of his name um this guy with the terminator this is before the matrix the way that happens is skynet the way your car drives you to the prison if you say the wrong thing online is skynet the way that Neuralink, when people are like but what about for paralyzed people they could put Neuralink in and move their legs again well i guess only if the wi-fi works right <laughs> so well, it's <laughs> Starlink. Starlink has to work I know. So then there's also these people that are just waking up. I just have to say this too. This is a huge danger because people woke up yesterday and then they think they find some lady on TikTok and then they're like, oh my gosh, my, my body's running cell phones. It's not lithium. Like, I don't know. There's certain things that go on in the conspiracy realm that people just, they're so desperate to try to be the first to tell someone or find it that they themselves don't look at it in any, it's like they don't have any tools of discernment for it. And then they're just like, hey, have you guys heard of Scientology? <laughs> That's what I was calling when I was first started. This is kind of what I consider like ambulance chasing in the conspiracy community of like, be the first to break the story regardless of anything else, because you know, it's going to get the clicks. Uh, and I don't, I don't really fault anyone for chasing the clicks, but man, it's, it gets rough out there when people are both chasing the clicks and wanting to be the first one to comment on the thing where like no one actually reads the thing because everyone's already like done their part. Like, Oh, I reported on it first. Someone else will get to the facts or oh, I did the first comment. It doesn't have to be useful. Someone else will do that later. Uh, I don't appreciate that part of the conspiracy theories, but it's also ironically like that is the crux of conspiracy theories, right? Of, of adding, like filling in the gaps yourself where a story doesn't have it already. Like there would be no conspiracy theories of everything was transparent and there was an answer for everything. So anytime there's not an answer for something, you're going to have a conspiracy theory that, that answers it for you. So that's kind of like, you're always going to have that, right? If you take down the Donald and then there's a mass shooting, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have like a hundred different conspiracy theories about who it is and why it is and all of this stuff. So I don't know. I, I It's hard to be against the ambulance chasing aspect and also be pro conspiracy theory. I know it's a little bit of like a, like an impossible puzzle to solve. 
Well, it's like a little bit of what I really appreciate about Gordo from those conspiracy guys is he kind of taught me that he never wanted to be an ambulance chaser of conspiracy. And he always felt like there was enough there in our history that why on earth would you have to talk about this? If you can, if you know it and you see the pattern and what's happening right now, just teach the people about the times that happened before. And that's kind of this, even with the Howard Hughes of it all and these other people I'm looking into that aren't just the, I call it low hanging fruit. I see the things that, how are you going to be a conspiracy theorist? And then tell me with Fox and CNN facts. Like so many times I watch the doomsdayers. They're like, Oh, look what CNN said today. Oh, look what Wolf Blitzer said. Oh my gosh, Tucker Carlson. And I'm like, why are you guys under the (laughs) assumption that this person, just because they've, they, oh my gosh, Howard left terrestrial radio and went to Sirius, the dog star that used to be XM Sirius. So we had the illusion of choice and then it became the one company we always knew it was because there was only going to be one satellite radio inside your car. And even in that, how good does your satellite radio work all the time? And you want a car that needs that? All right. This is a pro tip. I don't know if this actually still works anymore, but this is what it was told to me by one of my friends that that did work on um, like the X-Men, XM satellite connections in these cars. But that technically your car is always receiving the XM signal because it's being broadcast from outer space. So what's actually happening in your car is they've got a filter that like when it receives the signal, it's like, oh, am I allowed to have this signal? And I guess it sends some kind of like a thing back. That's like, I'm not allowed to have this. So you don't get it. I'm oversimplifying this, but that early ways, certain cars that the way you could get free satellite is you disconnect your battery for like six days or something so that there's no way that it can send these passive signals to say, I don't own this. So after you reconnect your battery, um, it's basically gone through like a cache out in their XM satellite system. That's like, Oh, we haven't heard back from car X. So like we don't have to keep filtering them out. Maybe the car was sold or it got scrapped or whatever. So then the next time you connect and it and it communicates with the satellite, it doesn't get filtered out and you start getting this free XM. I think they I think they already like fixed that so you can't do it as much anymore, but there's still a possibility of getting free XM by just uh, like hacking the network a little bit. And it reminds me of how old school cable used to work. Like after I got done paying the cable guy, like the extra 40 bucks to give us free HBO and all that. One of my friends that was like installed cable told us, and that this won't work anymore either since it went digital, yeah. but the old analog signal, it's the same thing. Your house always got all the channels. You were always getting HBO, mm-hmm. but there was a little piece of metal somewhere outside your house that was like, siphoning that out or blocking you from getting all the pay channels and all you had to do is find that little filter and you could take a drill and drill through it so that it was like hollow and then screw it back on so if the cable guy came back around they would just visually see okay the filter's still on there so that's part of the maintenance is they would go around and make sure that if you weren't paying for hbo then you had to have the blue filter on and if you weren't paying for cinemax you had the green filter on and if you just took those off they would know and just add them back again so anyways there's this still happens now. It's almost like AI, right? Like AI, when you connect to chat GPT, or you connect to any of these systems, they've got all the information you could possibly want. And the only thing that's in the middle of you two is some company has put a filter in between that. And now you got to like pay money to, for them to take that filter off. So I don't know. It, that's it your cable right like now. Me. Yeah. Like your internet, the, everybody gets the full Why? If you ever watch the guy hook up the internet at your house, he tests it and it'll blow the number up from where yeah. it should be. <laughs> yeah. And then he has to buffer it down to what you pay for. Yeah. And, oh, the same thing. I've, I've uh, done that before where I called up my cable company. I know this is compelling conspiracy knowledge, but this is actually somewhat interesting to me, but I call it my cable company and they let me know like, oh, yeah, our bad. You know, you're actually have been paying for this faster service and not the slower one. Hold on. Chick, 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 mm-hmm. Enter typing. And then, bam, Internet just speed just like immediately increases. So, yeah, like we we all could potentially be having a lot more access and faster. They just don't want to offer it um, because I don't know. I don't, uh, part of it's probably because they promised an infrastructure to this country in the 90s and they never actually like owned up to it. It got them out of antitrust laws where Bell Networks and AT&T and Sprint and all the conglomerates 
we're like, hey, you know what? Don't hit us with this antitrust, and we promise we will foot the bill for putting these like huge T1 fiber backbones in all the cities, and we'll dig up the roads. We'll do all that. Just please don't sue us. And the government was like, okay, we'll take you on your word for that. You guys are pretty trustworthy. And then here we are, you know, decades later, and none of the infrastructure happened. And now you've got all these places that need Starlink in order to get connected. And just like you were saying, Elon kind of being this like a uh, Skynet Terminator thing, even if you know those people that move out into the middle of the woods to circle jerk or whatever, raise mm-hmm. goats and homestead, guess what, man? They're, they're using Starlink, like nine out of 10 of those rural off the grid dudes to get internet. They're using freaking Elon Musk Starlink because there's really no other option. And if they wanted to make the scariest thing, an army of robots doesn't run without a network of satellites. So if you want to be Elon and you decide that it doesn't matter what side, Ukraine or Russia, what about if Elon just wants to take his army of robots and let it stand down between it? I just, there isn't anything. Democracy is just quiet. majority rule. It's mob rule. That's all democracy is. And the only thing a computer knows how to do is compute. So the only thing, no matter how fancy your quantum computer is, is it's a statistic machine for the 51% probability or above. That's it. It's an abacus. It's that's it. And so every single thing is on the internet. We're just not allowed to find it anymore. Like they can't ever delete anything. They can just bury it. Like everything we're talking about before. So somewhere there is a tone or a something, a a key, a backdoor key to the internet that every single keystroke you've ever done, every single picture you've ever put on, every website, everything, it all exists. It's all just different filters or drilled through holes that makes us not see it anymore. So I, have you heard the idea that Hillary had a backdoor key to the internet? I've I've heard that, dude. I've <laughs> I've heard a theory um, that one of my friends told me at a software development, huge software development company I worked for. I think it's a it's Symantec. Uh, I think they were in Lake Mary here in Florida. They do like antivirus and security and stuff. And one of the OGs there was telling me this story that he had worked at this facility on the West Coast at one point. Um, and this is going to sound outlandish, but that's what we're here for is some outlandish stories. But he's working in this this building and there's like, uh, and I'll dramatize some of this. There's like a hallway that no one's allowed to go to. And there's an elevator that goes to like a number that you don't have the key for, right? Like no one ever goes there. And he gets called for IT support and he goes to this uh, hallway that no one's allowed to go in. And he knocks on a door that no one's allowed to go in. And there's literally like a guy in there that is protecting a connection to the internet like the like if, if there was in a comical way right just imagine there's like a single line that comes into the west coast somewhere and that's the entire internet and there's like a guy guarding it and like he could theoretically trip over the wire and like disconnect the internet from everywhere um now this is a simplified version but this hallway in this room actually according to my my coworker. 100% existed that there was like a one way in one way out side of the internet and that if something were to go wrong or if it was like shut it down you know what I mean if someone said shut it down this guy had a button that would like shut down the internet and I know that that the, the, the way the internet actually works there's a bunch of different servers and it's cloud and there's replicas so if you connect to a site and you're 20 miles away from where I'm at you might actually connect to a different server to get it to you faster and all this stuff but they're all synchronizing with some like master record somewhere. And that apparently this guy had this connection to like this master record. So the, the theory that someone's got like the key to the internet is a very real thing. The, I guess the most practical version is the ICANN, the international Con- consortium of networking or whatever the hell the ICANN stands for. And it's these like massive uh, servers all over the world. And they all basically agree that, projectchainy.com is supposed to go to this server address or this uh, cluster of server addresses with a load balancer and I won't That's get into the not crap. George Bush's server address <laughs> right well well but there, there's the conspiracy in here is that like if you are the one that gets to decide if someone goes to projectchainy.com 
and then where that's going to bounce to usually on region for, you know, like speed of light and efficiency and everything. But if you were the Hillary Clinton version of ICANN, you could make it. So if 99% of the world goes to project Cheney.com, they go to this place. But if you've got some special configuration, if you're connecting from a, a certain Mac address or IP address or how, you know, you're, you're enter the Konami code, you know, ABAC or whatever, down up left, left, a right down right before the page loads, then you go to the secret Hillary Clinton only Konami code version of project Cheney. And that there might be like a whole section of people that have like their own internet so that you go to the same sites they go to, but they get the real version of it. You get the dumbed down version. And now they'd know your Al Gore rhythm, the guy who created all of this, the Al Gore. Um, they know your Al Gore rhythm so well that they would know what channel. And since your TV's digitized, you're telling them by what channels you're watching, what information you are or aren't privy to. Right. So now the next time you go to see and people are like, I can't believe it. I just saw an advertisement for, you know, like Kleenex. And then I go on to IG and there's Kleenex. It's like, yeah, well, they know. Uh, they know exactly what you're watching and beyond, I don't know if I'm all the way on board of like, they're always listening to the microphone being on and then piping that in. I think that that's, that's an easy way of phrasing it uh, and like simplifying it. But I think it's more than that. I think that they've got pattern recognition that knows what you just saw because it knows where you're at and it knows where everyone else is at. Like everyone thinks within their little bubble, like, Oh, the computer knows so much about me. Like it, it knows. It's the, the same narcissism of like being yeah. a cult member, right? Like, oh my God, the internet knows everything about me. I'm going to tell it my favorite things. And like, it knows me. It knows, but really it just knows that like a person with your attributes in your region surrounded by the other people that it has information on, you have a high, like a higher chance of taking a left here or buying the Coke instead of the Pepsi, not because it cares or knows about you in particular, but just because you happen to be this pixel on the screen and that pixel on the screen is a higher chance of being red than blue or whatever the algorithm is. And people convince themselves that it's like, Oh, they're listening to me. The microphone's on, they caught the camera. That's all true and possible. And maybe not as practical because like we've seen like the way the AI works, right? It doesn't store like for stable diffusion of the image stuff. It doesn't store all the different images it's ever seen and then pull on those. It just learns what the patterns are and then applies that pattern matching at a level that's like billions of times faster than any of us can do. So it seems like it's magic and it seems like they know what you're thinking. But really, it's like child's play. It would, it would be like if you had, you know, a two year old. And you were like, oh, I wonder if it's going to go for like that matte black, you know, dark thing on the ground or that shiny uh, neon sticky looking thing. Like, you know what they're going to go towards. And if you were and if you were like talking to a bunch of toddlers, they're like, man, Cheney, like can read our mind. She always knows exactly what we're going to go to. And it's like, no, no, no. Like, I know that you're going to go to the bright, shiny thing because I'm like, I'm just a, a level above that, I guess. I don't know. No, it's totally even in um, the conspiracy way of it all. I realized if I told people, oh, you guys be careful, they're going to fl false flag you because here's their patterns that they normally do. No one paid attention because everybody's trying to be a soothsayer. So instead, I'm like, I have a magic spell I'm going to do to kill the king. And then everybody's like, oh, my gosh, I'm paying attention. But really, them paying attention to me being like, so you guys, I did this spell. I'm killing Betty White and killing the queen at the same time. All I did was make you not get loosed. You laughed at, holy shit, Cheney just killed the queen. Even in your head, if you thought it for one second, which it's absurd. But it's <laughs> it's like this is <laughs> this is just part of but the absurdity. I think we lean in you live action role play until everybody observes that you're the thing and then you become the emperor and then you could take your all your clothes off and we're not allowed to tell her she doesn't have clothes on. When she <laughs> it's just like this thing that everybody is so convinced everything's a top 40 or like oh. I got there first, but they're. Um, you're just a 51%. My phone pings by your phone. 
So now our phones are next to each other. So they're getting all my information and all this. They know if all of our phones are together. Oh my gosh, they only need to ping one microphone on for a second. They're at a church revival. When they leave, we'll all give them this. Like it's it's there, more simple. <laughs> there's there's also, and I, I'm trying my best to like not give away names and like specifics here, but I got a, a very close friend that worked at Alphabet, like high up in Alphabet. And this Alphabet's the Google parent company. And this was, this was like maybe 10 years ago or something. But I remember them uh, explaining to me in a very vague way, but I put it together years later, like, oh, that's what they were talking about, that the company they were working for, which they didn't tell me it was Alphabet at the time, that they had the technology to know without you ever logging on anything, just like the way that you click around and the DNA of how you act online, like how long it takes for you to click between pages, how long you dwell, like all of that comes down to a fingerprint. And, and the digital fingerprint used to be like, what browser are you using? What plugins are in your browser? Because there's a way to pull the browser from a website to get like a hash of all the different things you've got installed. And uh, there's million different ways to figure out like, okay, you've got this very unique fingerprint. So you're Cheney. Like we know that you're Cheney, even though you've never logged in, you're behind a VPN, you're doing all this stuff, but like just like a gate or a heat detection signature, like we know who you are, but there were laws that prevented them from saying like, okay, we know who Cheney is because we're Google and we've got all of the public records. So we theoretically know what Cheney's address and phone number and past phone number and all the place you've worked and all the money you've ever made, like all that, we've got access to it. And we have access to this digital fingerprint that we know is Cheney, but because of law reasons, because of legalese, we're not allowed to connect those two things. So at no point can we take the traffic that we know is you and actually say that we know that it's Cheney and then start pairing at the Cheney information. So I was, I was just wondering, you know, like out loud, I'm talking to my close friend that, that is like high up in the company that's telling me this stuff. Like, well, is it like, what's preventing these two things from connecting? Is it like, couldn't someone just be doing it and saying that they aren't going to do it and no one would be the wiser because like the judge would be, you know, like not a technophile. And the way that they were explaining this to me was like, no, you don't get it. Like they don't have to do that. Like, they don't have to connect these two systems because the systems are smart enough to know, like, don't ever cross pollinate. Don't ever like, you know, go from A over here to B over here. Like, here's the way that you guys can communicate. It's almost like Mormons fucking through the hole in the sheet, right? Or like, it's yeah, like, like there's a loophole. That they're never yeah, there's gonna a catch. loophole. And you don't ever have to close that loophole. Just like the Mormons, right? Like, if they can make a baby doing that, then like the the service has been fulfilled. You don't have to dress it up or dress it down any differently. Like if it works, it works. And the same way that Google has been operating. So now this is 10 years ago. So now Google is already an expert at knowing like, and I hope I'm conveying this right, but like they know who Cheney is because they see the fingerprint and they know how that fingerprint acts because they know how Cheney acts. And without actually saying this fingerprint is Cheney, it's more like saying, hey, everything that this fingerprint does is a lot like everything this anonymous person does. Let's just pretend the fingerprint is the anonymous person and, and treat them as if they were the same person. And that's the loophole. And what it means is that Google doesn't have to know that you've logged in or that where your IP address is or none of that. They just know like based on your behavior online that this is you and now here's what I'm going to market to you. And that's a large part of why a red car drives by and then you look at your phone and you see the same red car being advertised to you because they know that you were by a red car because that red car is also connected to the internet, right? They didn't read your mind. They didn't use your camera. They literally knew that there was a red car in front of you. And take that times you know a billion with all of these ai things that are analyzing patterns constantly and then if we could analyze patterns enough and we could it's just all it's doing is moving abacus dots but it on a grand scale of the clothes you wear the music you listen to the things that traumatized you when you might get a cold it's just moving little things it's just computing these ideas to the person that you might be and then after we have all this information of all the stuff that you like and don't like and your fears and loves, then over on this side, 
We take the DNA of you and find out what your whole bloodline was, give you little pieces of it to pacify you and tell you, oh, you're from Scotland and you have Nigerian, you're 2%, whatever little thing that they want to give you to pacify you. But in reality, I'm taking all that data and blueprint that I gathered and I'm putting it over all the people and bloodlines and specifics that have ever been and everywhere you've ever tailed to these people because then the computer can gather all the proof of all of our past that we don't know and even use more of that when it... Uh, oh my gosh! Look at this crest it put up here. How did it know that Cheney would be interested in this certain little thing in Ireland? And it's like, oh, because Cheney's mom did CRISPR and that guy married that lady. And there's information <laughs> they can share between their marriage that the court or legalese can never ask for. So sometimes we just get married because it's the best business arrangement that you can possibly make if you're a criminal. It's the best business arrangement for you to hide your wealth and your money and your everything. And so another cue thing that is always said is follow the wives is it doesn't matter the names of Bill Gates that they put out for you. Why is Elon marrying Grimes? What is Melinda up to? Who has Big Mike always been? It's like, these are the things. It's like we get this certain narrative and conspiracy and we bite it and it tastes delicious and then we run with it. But we never ask the question of like, huh, what really happened when Bezos and his wife split up and he ended up with that other woman right before all the Amazon trucks took over our neighborhoods? Like, what kind of wealth is done there? Like, is that the same as Roundup and Monsanto that Bear can just come in and say this side of the company is bankrupt and nobody even knows Bear Aspirin did all of this? Like, uh, those are the interesting things where I feel like the wife and the womb and the child, the husband can have a rumble death and nobody's even aware. The bloodline goes on. And all of a sudden, the Kennedys carry all this gravitas in our country. But who were the wives? Who is Jackie O? Why did Onassis want to protect Jackie out of all the Red Sparrows, her and her sister? Why did the most powerful businessman on the entire planet marry an ex-president that was just assassinated in front of all of America? Why did he marry her and keep her safe? And then a thing with the Onassis and a thing with the Maxwells and a thing with all of these people that nobody talks about, maybe bigger than pharmacy, maybe bigger than space, is the propaganda. All these people are publishers. All these people are publishers. They own your magazines. They own your news channels. They own your radio stations. And so I would say the highest magic is your propaganda. And you know what, what else? To you. Really, this is something that I only know through doing the Occult Disney podcast, which I'll, I'll do in an episode later on the, the Doug movie. Um, but the number of famous children's books um, that are linked to intelligence operations is like mind blowing. Like, like after, you know, two or three, it was like, Oh, that's a funny little, you know, a coincidence, but after like six or seven and it's like, okay, somehow there's like a direct pipeline from being an intelligence agent and then having a like world renowned, you know, like award winning children's book that then gets adapted by Disney and gets sold in all the stores and gets sold like, Roald Dahl, a good example. Uh, James and the Giant Peach. He was an intelligence uh, operations officer. The uh, 101 Dalmatians. This came from an intelligence operation. Um, like there's so there's so many. You I go right back to the dog. Then uh, Corella Deville wanting to make a skin um, out the coat out of the dogs, but we know the Pope wears shoes made out of kids. <laughs> it's like, it, like it literally is the dog thing again. But I also um, think, uh, what better way for me to take a creepy old man? And if he's done everything right, the opposite of a shaming ritual, if he was a dirty old pedophile, would be to give him a red suit and allow children to sit on his lap in a mall. Like, so <laughs> I take shots a, fired at Santa. Yeah, so if I take a gross, dirty man that did everything right and I let him be the author of a children's book, now he gets to go on tour and all the moms that I read this, they put the nostalgia into that guy and they let their child be alone with him. And now he gets some easy walk in like a Walt Disney because, wow, look how much he does for kids. Of course, he's going to be kind to kids. Go on. I'll leave my kid alone with him. I'll let my kid go to his camp. Good Miller. 
I mean, this actually dovetails pretty well with the box saga because Santa Claus actually has a very high role in the box saga. They they look at him as being not just Father Christmas, but like father to everyone. And that the the gift that he gives everybody is sort of like their life. Like, like Santa Claus, because in the box saga, everyone's inbred. So Santa Claus would have been like your grandpa but it would have been everybody's grandpa. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so they like the out of Africa theory. They are like, we're sapiens. It's, it's we the all came Eden theory or the out, the out of Helsinki theory more specifically. So like we all came from Adam and Eve, but there was just Adam. We all came from Adam sucking his own cock. Well, oh, at, well, kind <laughs> of, except what really happened is that, the first person came. I don't know if, how much of the box saga you know, but that humanity started from an ape and a goat. An ape and a goat banged, and they had like a mutated human child. And then I guess somehow that human child had another human, and then they mated, and then so on and so on and so on. Now I'm sure there's probably someone that's an expert in uh, boctology that'll be I like. I probably well, fell out. There, here's a few things probably why I didn't get deep. One, pigs are way more human than monkeys one. So already when you have the monkey theory, uh, when the monkeys, I'm like, Oh, that's still the AIDS in the monkey. Oh, look at us. Look at, Hey monkeys, they stand up straight. And so do we like, it's just such a like little kids way of looking at like, we came from monkey. Cause look at, they're like this. And then if we just stood up, look at us. I don't know. It's such like a, where, where are you at? Where did, where did humans come from? Uh, I think we are e- like, I think we maybe came here. Like this is somehow kind of like, uh, do you remember, um, flight of the navigator? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, humans are aliens, right? Yeah. I just, so then, so then either where did the that alien or we, um, I am more into the Sophia myth of it all. Like I'm more into an idea of, um, Every single thing that I've ever seen create life has always been a woman. And so the idea to me that any godhead would be a bearded man goes into that Santa Claus myth again. (laughs) And so I probably haven't gotten into the box saga because I cannot think of more disgusting liquid than semen. Maybe... And so also, the- I just want to be clear, just just so that you don't feel left out. The the semen aspect of the box saga is just the male side. So the exact same thing is happening on the female side. So all the women, while all the men are off doing, you know, just non-gay guy stuff, jerking each other off and whatnot, the ladies are all getting together. And that's where the thimble came from. That the thimble was actually made not for sewing but that you would insert it into yourself to absorb any extra moisture. And then you would use that as the offering. So all the ladies would be putting thimbles up their snatches and then passing them around and drinking from them. And that's kind of I mean, vagina dentata. <laughs> I mean, it's so yeah, homosexual. Like, it's like vagina dentata has teeth in it. So if a lady <laughs> had a thimble inside of her and you stuck your tiny little penis inside, you might get teeth in your vagina. <laughs> this is all the more reason that I should jerk you off, buddy. <laughs> it like literally is the gayest thing you've created an alien inside oh no not again the vagina dentata and the vagina might have teeth but really that's just your buddy who is a real homosexual trying to convince straight men that maybe they'll play with him too but dude, it gets it gets so much weirder we don't even have the time we'll, we'll wrap this in like 15 minutes too by the way i didn't realize we're almost at <laughs> I just hours. been. I'm like, whatever. I'm just hanging out with you, playing. This is what we do in a. I, I gotta finish watching Doug again and take my notes for my, yeah, yeah, my yeah. Disney podcast. But so, so the other aspect of this, I have to stop playing just so I can concentrate <laughs> on on describing this. So the here's the crux of it, and this is what kind of like irritated me the most. Um, and irritate, I think might might not be the right word, but like disappointed, right? So I start reading the box saga for myself for the first time. I've heard about it. For the last year and a half, it's been on podcasts, like little samplings here and there. And then there was like a little a little squabble, maybe like a ingest squabble. But two people were getting into it. It was like Juan and I think Longo on uh, one of Zertus's shows. 
And it was like this, and I'm going to paraphrase. These aren't exact quotes, but there was this sentiment of like, Juan, stop bringing up the icky parts because you're going to turn people away. Like, we we don't want to turn people away from this thing. We want people to come towards it, pun not intended, and like really absorb the information that's in it. But if you lead with all the dick stuff, people are just going to be like, ew, weird, gay, dick stuff. You know, that's that's weird. I'm not really into that and keep moving along. So there's this, I call it gatekeeping. And I've been, someone was like, that's not gatekeeping. It feels like gatekeeping to be like, Hey, we want you to talk about this thing, but don't bring up this one aspect of it. Like, don't bring it up because it'll turn people away. We don't want to turn people away. And my mind's like, well, why don't you? So here's the thing. Here's, here's the crux of the whole entire box saga is that for every one person born in the world, it was supposed to be created by over 22,000 people. And the way that this works, is almost like compound interest. If we go back to like fifth grade, you know, bank math, but you put a dollar in and you earn 10 cents on that dollar. Then the next time you earn interest on a dollar 10 and then you get a dollar 20 and then you earn interest on a dollar, you know, so like you only ever put in a dollar, but it keeps increasing over time. So the way the box saga works and all the circle jerks and all the dick sucking is that, all the lowest class people and then when people were separated into I'll just make an arbitrary number up for the convenience of it. Let's say there's three classes, upper, middle, lower class, right? All the lower class people would give their offerings to the middle class people. So if you were a lower class dude, then you would give your semen to the middle class dude. He would drink it. And if you were a a lower class woman, you would offer your juice to a middle class woman and she would drink it. And this keeps perpetuating on to then where the middle class people, they all go around and they give their offerings to the higher class people. And then all the high class people, essentially, even if you only drank one cup, right, that cup represents all the cum that all that middle class guy drank from all the lower class people. So through this like compound interest formula, even if one dude only actually drinks 10 cups of semen, every one of those cups represented 10 cups that that guy drank. And every one of those cups represented 10 cups that that guy drank. So you got all these poor people that are given their cum to the middle class and all the middle class give their cum to the high class and all the cum in the high class people, they give it to the king, right? So by the time it gets to the one king, he is drinking the equivalent of 11,111 people's cum. And the queen does the exact same thing. She drinks the equivalent of 11,111 people's juice, right? So then now when they come together and they have a child, that child represents the collective energy and DNA and power of 22,224 people, the extra two being the actual king and the queen banging. So now when the kid comes out, it's it truly is the effort of over 22,000 people for every one. And here's the catch is that none of those people, the lower class and the middle class and the high class, none of them bang. None of them ever have kids. They don't go into a dark alley. They don't get drunk at a party and go and have kids. Everybody worships this concept of procreation and of marriage and that only the king and queen get the bang and no one else gets the bang. We only drink and give cum and pussy juice for them to drink and everything. That's where it loses me. And that's the most wild part that you're saying you're going to get 22,000 people and they're just going to be doing all this sexual stuff. But nobody at any point is like, hey, I think I'm going to try this thing. Everyone would stop them. They'd be like, no, 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 that's sacrilege. It's okay to, it's like, (laughs) this is the thing that I think that for whatever reason, there's a lot of shitty things about being a female. But one of the good things that I think about being a female is throughout life, you can not only experiment with your sexuality, you can truly love another woman. Like you could touch her back when she's naked and doesn't feel, you don't feel like a lesbian about it. Like you watch women give birth with their legs so all the way. Lesbian. Yeah, I know. But I also, it's like, there's so many aspects of us being around each other that isn't sexual. And as a lesbian, I can say there's so many different scales of how much love people want to show, like just women, that how gay they are and how maybe they different gay they are for different people. And for some reason, our society... 
has allowed women to express this emotion. It never really has for men since the pederast days. And for some reason, the philosophers always need young, 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 young boys. This is always where it eventually goes because why would I want old semen if I can have young semen? It, it like eventually always goes there because why do I want 22,000 old men in my village if I'm really going to create a super bean? I want 22,000 of the strongest things. So now I want to genetically manipulate those things if they're never allowed to have sex. Only the blonde who aired blue eyed people are allowed to sleep together because I only we're creating this perfect kid out of everyone. I mean, this is box saga. Yeah. And so I do believe this is it's OK if you're gay and your Christian religion and your Christian brainwashing is all the stuff inside of you that is making you have to. I really believe the entire trans agenda is because a lot of those people were traumatized that it wasn't OK to be gay. So maybe if I cut my dick off and I become a female, I'll go to heaven. Like somewhere that it's like so deep inside their brain. I don't, I, don't get the lo- I don't get the logic there. And I know that was the point that there's a hard. Yeah. And so I feel like there's something like th- there's dudes like one gay dude with power and then every little way, because the thing that turns guys on for some reason that's so different than women is a guy that's gay. That's the most amount of alpha male prowess gay. He wants to make the least gay guy his bitch. The least gay guy that I could have sex with. That would be what would turn me on the most because it's all still some kind of prowess over you. So it's like somewhere... It's like you could admit to the world you're a cuck. You can admit to the world you're a beta. You could admit to the world that all the brainwashing and all the uh, hops and cannabis smoke have lowered your estrogen level to a way. And it's okay if you're a soft dude and it's okay if you love other men or you're desperate, like need companionship from another man or to hug or to roll around. All that stuff's okay. But all this religion and brainwashing stuff, to me, I'm like, how do you not see this for what it is? There was some dude that was really desperate trying to convince all the other dudes around to let him suck his dick. Like, (laughs) how can I touch that guy's penis? And then how is that guy going to let me touch his son's penis? This is all Santa Claus. Same shit. Every way is by some creepy dude that wants to somehow touch children. Like it's all like some little creepy way. Oh, you want the weather to be this? Bring me your kid. Sacrifice me your firstborn and then I'll make the weather nice for this. We don't know what they were really doing to them kids afterward. We're just assuming they threw them into the fire. Like it's like that's what China is. Oh, you're allowed to have one kid. Oh no, what what happens to all the other kids if you're not allowed to have boys? Where do all those other kids go? Don't worry about it. Just give them to me in the fire. Give them to your god vermint, and we're we're gonna take care of that for you. Don't worry. The weather's gonna stay good. And so I just feel like the box saga, suck your cock saga. Like you're just you're <laughs> you've watched so much porn, and the only way that you can come now is by seeing another man's penis. And so you can't even get it up for your wife that you have to have another man come in the room of the porn that you watch. So a lot of the times it's a big black man. You have to have him come in the room and fuck your wife so you can watch that cum shot so you can get off because you're so used to watching a penis. I feel violated that you've actually been looking through my internet history. (laughs) I never gave you permission to do any of that. (laughs) <laughs> this is actually kind of funny though because this also comes up in the, the performance anxiety thing was a very particular part that i read in one of the box saga books that imagine like you're like you've just drank all this all this semen right and you got to go and see the king and now the king has to drink from you because that's the whole like this is literally all of society in the box saga the military was completely centered around this fertility right. The entire military had nothing to do with protection or aggression or fighting. It was all just to facilitate these villagers going around and collecting from each other and eventually funneling it all the way up to the king. And there was they were making this statement of like, you've been doing this for the last six months. You've, you've drank all this fluid. You've got it all in you. And now you have to go up in front of the freaking King and you got to stand. Um, he stands on a stool or you stand on a stool and the King gets down in front of you. And he's like, all right, out with it. Hurry up. I'm the King. You know, like it, even though he's the one receiving and he's like in this prone position on his knees, he's still your superior. And the fact that 
that you're offering to him, you're actually subservient. So it's like this weird inversion of like in like modern day society, if there's a dude that's on his knees in front of another dude doing this, right? You're already like, oh, there's the alpha, there's the beta, but it's it's the exact inverse in the box saga. So it was like, what happens if you get up in front of the king, the like the biggest, most important time of your entire life and you can't get it up for him. Like there's no, so they had like these Royal fluffers, but it was all about like, get hard for your King son. I don't know, but it's, and not, it I bet there. you, totally I bet there. you a thousand bucks. The person from the higher cast, whoever was the one that was the transporter of the semen or the juice, which if there's juice, there's another conspiracy that's just been solved for you. Squirting is real. <laughs> So oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this this conveys that it is real. And so I bet you a hundred percent the person of the upper caste got to pick the semen carrier. So I, as this ugly, bearded, nasty thing, I would like that person to be the one that carries the semen up to me. I bet you the higher caste always got to pick the looker. So this is just another way that some sick, nasty old man got to, and his poor wife who wasn't a lesbian and she just got married off by her sick father. And she just had to sit next to him and drink coochie douche that she wasn't into at all. (laughs) Some of them were. Some of them were into it. I just feel like like you made a good point. I don't know of a lot of females out there that are like the box saga is the true history. We need to revert back to the box saga. <laughs> no. It is one hundred and one percent dudes. <laughs> it's like I think after you get to Bertaria, you um, take a hard <laughs> right into the box saga. <laughs> like, oh no, we've been on this land for a few years. No women have come. How do we procreate? We've made it past the homunculus. Oh fuck. It's the box saga. And what really the craziest thing to me, it doesn't matter if it's the Unk. It doesn't matter if it's the Virgin Mary. It doesn't matter if it's the Venus of Willendorf. It doesn't matter what the oldest of any part of the world, any of the deities you pick, they're all women. All of them are women and they're all a vagina. Even the Venus, even Virgin Mary is a depiction of the Vesica Pisces. That's all it is showing you. And so I just think the box saga is scared of cunt saga (laughs) it is they've put teeth in the vagina which is just the aliens they say the scariest yeah they say the very scariest image to men on the planet is a vagina with teeth and that's why the alien from the movie aliens represents the very scariest thing because it's phallic and at the end of it is a vagina with teeth so the fallacy is what women fear the most and the vagina with teeth is what you know but i think no it's all what men fear (laughs) <laughs> like ladies i know ladies and they're totally fine with dick they're not scared of it they're scared of what it's attached to sometimes <laughs> so i'm just curious would you not find a vagina with teeth scary i when i saw a fish with teeth i was like what the fuck <laughs> yeah i think it would be scary but i also think it would be the best propaganda if i was a homosexual man and wanted all the young boys to start thinking of different stuff when they were jerking off them vagina i would tell them there's teeth in there and i would that would be a really them. weird to find out like that's your fetish like all of a sudden it's like oh this is working now <laughs> All the fetishes all come from dudes that were like, oh, here, you're a 13 year old over over coddled boy. You still have to come into the dressing room with me while I change clothes. Oh, you still have to come into the um, bathroom with me as an eight year old boy. And there's other women in here getting naked and your head knows they're getting naked. But all you can see is their feet. (laughs) I just think. And then this is the other thing that's happening. All these young boys can find all the same free porn that all of us can find. And so at the edge, like how we're sitting right now in the video games playing, people are jerking off to the video game. But me and you over here are flashing weird images of next level stuff. And so we're just... If anyone's actually jerking off right now to this game, I want you to at least join the Patreon and join us like the 3 or the $5 tier. This is not a free jerk off session. At least I know some way back when times were rough, I thought about just like being a patriotic lesbian and yelling at men to take back their country and lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> like this same thing about I'd be like, you fucking cuck, you're going to let your kid get vaccinated. <laughs> it, honestly, there's a there's definitely a market for that. Give me your bank account if you have a mask on today. 
<laughs> like a, like a conspiracy theory pay pig sort of situation humiliation I, I can make a cuck saga of men that instead of sucking their own dick they just send me money like will it hurt the well, yeah, same? That, that's pay pig pay pig oh i love this we need to start a pay pig account <laughs> like anytime that you want to drink your own piss or suck your own dick and this used to just be something that they talked about like rod i wonder i bet you rod stewart you know, when they were like, he removed a rib so we could suck his own dick. He was just that practicing. Was, the... was that Rod Stewart too? I heard that about Marilyn Manson. Yeah, I think they give it. Maybe they were just practicing the box saga. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just have no time or space for. I mean, but I guess everybody has to go through their layers of things and it becomes their cryptocurrency. Because well, here, here's, here's my entire fascination with the box saga. And this might even surprise you, but it's it's nothing to do with the icky, weird, gay dick stuff, which is, in my opinion, the most interesting part. I don't care about what Ben Balderson referred to as the, the Dr. Seuss. Like, this word sounds like this word, and it sounds like this word. And, like, yeah, he was like, these people just, like, either didn't read enough Dr. Seuss or read too much. The part that interests me is the hypocrisy and and not in a condescending hypocrisy. Like I think everyone's a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. I'll, hypocrite. I'll call you a hypocrite. Yeah, there we go. So I've I've said that to someone before, and they were like, "I'm not a hit." Like they got really offended, and I was like, "Dude, I'm just." My like, intro to my a- show says it's okay to change your mind. <laughs> well, and then and that's not necessarily the same thing as being a but hypocrite, it, but it kind of yeah, kind of. You is. change your mind, and then you still are like, "Shit, I sold so much of this cryptocurrency, <laughs> and I really think it's dead <laughs> energy." But I've invested ten thousand dollars in it. This is why people back their own education. I just spent a hundred thousand dollars to re- learn all the wrong information i just told all my friends to watch john stewart i've been the biggest hillary supporter how am i going to change my mind no I- I've, I've convinced all the elderly people in my family to get the shot and now i just realize it might cause myocarditis we have to say <laughs> this that we're not on on uh youtube so yeah we'll just get it all out yeah like we're just this is an episode we're just spilling the tea <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that's it. And so many people, when we you get to conspiracy and there's so much stuff and you're you like come to people and you're like, oh my gosh, you guys, did you know the government knows about our aura? And you're like, yep. And then you come to people and you're like, oh my gosh, you guys, did you know the men who stare at goats is real? And you're like, yep. And then people are like, oh my gosh, stranger things. Did you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like it becomes all these things that they're like, oh, and you can see that sometimes now I'm a grown man and I'm so over all these people knowing the same information I know. I need something deeper. What has nobody looked into yet so I can be the first? And so then your ego led you there, but now you've fucking spent $100,000 of your money and your crypto's wrapped up in it and you've told so many people about it and you've boosted it. How are you going to be the one to turn on your audience? Like, how are you going to be the one? How is Juan ever going to be like, the entire homunculus thing is fake? (laughs) (laughs) I know. He can't. He can't. He's he's locked himself into that closet. I'm locked in. I'm never going to ever be the one to ever, ever, ever be able to vote for Joe Biden for you. That is never going to be the ship I can sail away on. Although in, in Juan's defense, because I've heard him say this a million times, that he doesn't consider himself an occultist, which in a way seems like a lie. But that he no, the reason the homunculus thing I actually was teasing is because it is proof that all these people did this thing. Juan himself didn't research all this stuff and then become the guy on YouTube that had that weird chicken egg thing yeah. growing inside. <laughs> the, you know, he didn't start practicing the thing. He could we could all research the box saga and tell everybody about it and do a thing. We didn't start becoming the church of Bach. You know, it's like you well, know, I, guess, I love I DJT, but I still haven't been to Mar-a-Lago. The, what you say that the church of Bach is where this fascinates me because there there's a very real like like a personal attachment where you start talking about the icky stuff about the 22,224 people and someone says, "Wait, but if you say that, no one's going to want to hear the rest." And my first thought is like, "A, well, they're not interesting people because this is incredibly fascinating, but also B, who cares? Who cares if someone hears it and then doesn't want to hear the rest because they get turned off by the whole thing that it's about. And that's where it gets weird because 
uh, some of the responses is like, well, because this is the only alternative to Western religion. This is the only thing that hasn't been pushed on us by all the higher powers from all across the world. So therefore in this same enemy of my enemy is my friend thing because of the novelty of the box saga and because it turns sex on its head and it turns marriage on its head and it makes just bros doing bro stuff on gay again because it's like the antithesis to what everything else is it has to be the right thing because it's the opposite of what i perceive to be the wrong thing and then they hook on to it like well then it must be the good thing because everything else i know is the wrong and the bad thing and this new thing has to be the antithesis of that which just kind of feels like that whole Hegelian dialectic, right? Like they're just being used to usher in the the sort of goalposts and figure out where the center point is. But yeah, I don't understand why. I don't I don't understand why someone would get attached to the box saga and feel like they have to defend it any more than someone latching on to Christianity. And like if you hear someone blaspheming against the Lord, you're like, hey, I have to put a stop to this. Uh it's the same thing, but like. Christians will criticize box sagas for doing that, but box sagists will be like, wait a minute, you know, that stupid sky daddy Christian crap. Meanwhile, hey, this ape and a goat, you know, fucked, and then this guy sucked his own dick, and then that's how we got the alphabet. And it's, I don't understand. And I guess that is what fascinates me about the box saga, not the fact that they're doing this, but the fact that someone's like, you know what? That makes sense that 22,000 people would get together and no ugly people ever banged in the dark drunk ever and the military existed for millions of years and no one ever got into a fight all because everyone's sucking each other off that's what's fascinating me not the sucking off part but that like this logic somehow computes the people and they latch onto it like i want to understand why you're like sky daddies are silly goats and apes are not silly like what is that because whatever that difference is like i want to harness that thing and it's also what is it about that there's just a weird thing and not that women aren't horny and women don't want to have sex, but so much of existence for like, and I think once men have enough sex in their life, it's not such a thing that they're like, every second of my brain goes to this. Every second of my brain goes to this. But I really do think it's a plague of men that are not having any sex for years at a time. And so it's not just that there's homosexuality that's not being talked about. And it's, I hate the fucking word incel because I feel like intended, like dudes have I been, love the word. I think it's an awesome word. Well, I just think it's not the word itself has been in existence forever. Like dude, there's been dudes desperate to get laid forever, like forever. <laughs> it's like kind not of any story of human history and conflict. Yeah, in it's general. not any weird thing. So I feel like the um, hate that must, build from a dude who can't get laid it must be like something women really don't understand like it must be something that like a visceral hate of years that the only hand that's ever touching your dick is your own it makes it very easy for me to understand how you would lean into something like this like you're already halfway there and don't we all already want to be halfway there with whatever it is we're believing in understanding And so it's like the crazy idea is how many of these cults and things are really a wonderlust idea. It doesn't matter if it's like there's very few people like Ben Balderson that like live off grid and the things that he built are for like his wife and his family and then for other people to come and learn how to do those things. A lot of the guys that are attempting this shit over the last few years, they just have this wonderlust sex cult Bohemian Grove idea for real that they mock but their dream is to lay by a river naked and just have a whole bunch, like a hundred virgins. Like deep down, it's still like somewhere there's a sex idea they're selling you about heaven. And it's just like, <laughs> they're, they're, it's just, I feel like there's people that don't have enough sex or something in real life that they're, that it's like such an obsession or they did some perverted stuff themselves. Like they jerk off to weird things or like David Carradine. I don't know, but it's like, Whatever the shame is. Was that not an assassination? I always wonder. I, that <laughs> felt like a, a humiliation assassination. Oh, yeah. I totally think that. I, I think from Robin Williams and uh, 
Bourdain, I think, but I think David Carradine, total hum- humiliation. But I think a lot of guys are like choking themselves. Girls fucking like it when they're coming. I think guys are doing this weird shit too. I think guys are massaging their prostate and gaping their holes and doing weird, 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 weird shit. Like I think the straight men that are, in, and I'm cool with it, whatever. If you're into butt plugs and into all this strapping I'm on I'm changing stuff, my email password as soon as we're off this. The amount of stuff that I've heard that straight men are into blows my mind. And I think that so many of them have shame about it and touching their own buttholes. This is a thing too. So all this shame builds up and you need a box saga. <laughs> like well, in Bach, uh, it means goat. It, it means goat. It Bach literally means strong in German. That's why you have like Bach beer. Like it always has Bach on it. So it's funny that it's the goat saga. It's the saga of the goat. The poor goat. It doesn't get enough homage in our human history. <laughs> uh, the, you're, yeah. I know. Like this is the weirdest thing too about the Bach it's saga. Is every time you go to make a joke, it seems color. funny, and then you read about it, and you're like, oh, they really do think that and like the box saga and the box meaning the goat like this has actually been presented to me that there's so many words that reduce down to goat that it's used as proof that the box saga is the original language and religion because so many things translate back down to goat because the people came from a goat it's like the weirdest circular or logic let me just, just tell always... people like this is like a real common sense thing and this is there's a reason that the first god like after venus because they first made all these deities of women's legs and ways that we came out of a vagina because people were in all of it for thousands and thousands of years and then the next god that comes to be is abraxas and we're like oh my gosh look at this chicken head with these serpent legs guess what serpents and chickens both gave us eggs eggs so we were like oh my gosh we can eat these eggs this is this is life-saving so we worship these things for a few thousand years and then we get to husbandry so even the word husband this is such a big powerful word because all of a sudden now we realize goats and cows they can give us this next level nutrients so do you know how many thousands of years cows became our deity it's like there's a silliness that goes on sometimes where there's a common sense, but it's somewhere our ego wants so much. It's like, I need my pee to heal you. I need Mm -hmm. to be the chosen one from God. So much of that is like, Oh my gosh, Cheney is King Arthur. Cheney just pulled the sword out of the stone. It's there's so much of this that goes on in the conspiracy realm that in clouts and thumbs up that just might be the same as you standing in line and taking their little wafer on your tongue. It's like, oh, I don't know. I mean, that's actually a really great analogy to end this on. But there's something about being like uh, because like I was raised Catholic and I went to the first communion and all of that stuff. And I remember the feeling of like i get to go and eat you know the body of christ like it was kind of like i'm 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 pretty hot shit like i don't know about you have you ever eaten the body of christ because if not i mean i think i might be a little bit more christ-like than you i've I've eaten the body of mary a few times if you know what i mean (laughs) from a thimble (laughs) yeah that's the other thing too if all this is real if all this is true I pretty much am going to guarantee that I know a couple of nice little whores good at their jobs and a few lesbians that if you're just some dude sitting on a thing jerking off your one buddy and you just came to this over the last four years, you are so far behind this mission. <laughs> right. Like I yeah, am you're so, surrounded by geniuses. <laughs> I've literally eaten pussies of girls that probably suck 10,000 dicks. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I'm so powerful here. No wonder. I am I the goat? Am I the greatest of all time?" <laughs> you know what? You you legit might be honest something. Like if you can find and maybe this is where like <laughs> If I can turn that super straight person, because if you turn them, you just like they did all the legwork for you, right? Literally, they've done. I didn't ever have to pollute my body with a penis. Exactly, and and funny enough, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the the icky part of the box saga. Not intellectually, but just like like visually. Once you got from the middle class or the higher class or the higher class up into like the king class. Um, they didn't want to touch you. Like it was gross to actually have to touch another dude's dick. 
So when you get up to these higher levels, they actually have like a full description of how they would make, but like a little loop. And they would have a little like miniature noose and they would put the member through the noose and then just hold it right up to the front of the king's mouth so that he wouldn't actually have to make contact. He could just kind of like open and it would come in. And because because if he actually touched your dick, that gay. might be gay. Yeah, that's probably I gay. Maybe I'm just coming to the conclusion that women witches, like a coven, made this whole entire religion <laughs> so that they could sit and laugh not only at the idea of a little dick in a noose, but the idea of the king putting it in his mouth and told them it was all magic and that this had to happen and they had to go and sit in these little fields and jerk each other off. And the witches just laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> Because this is like, I even think the like the lesbians, the ladies, and then I even think the women with the kids, because shout out to anyone this week, um, we're going into on the Secret Society of Good Guys. We're starting with the beanstalk theory, because I think these child stories are all the real truth and they hide um, our sky from us and what the stars are really saying. They tell us about plagues. I believe this is the way that women told their children the truth of where they came from after the real man who protected them, the husband or the father was came and taken out by a a warring tribe. So I think these bedtime stories that exist somewhere, I think the only women who would be saved after somebody came and raped our pillaged our village would be the women that knew how to play politics to save their children. So they would have allowed a new Lord to be their Lord. And the only way they could disguise these stories would be to their kids about things, maybe like Jack and the Beanstalk and maybe the old lady in the shoe. And why are all these grim fairy tales? throughout every single language and every single culture and every single thing. Why do they exist so prevalent in Disney? So we're going to start with Jack and the Beanstalk. I, I'm on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'll be there. And I'm it's I don't know if you did this on purpose, but you said pillage the village. And that's actually one of my favorite quotes from White Trash, Two Heaps and a Bean, No Effects album. It's on the song called Kill All the White Man. And he says, the white man came to pillage my village. It's one of the best lines on that whole album. So I was actually thinking of Three Amigos when I said it. (laughs) (laughs) Rape the horses and ride off on the women. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a good good place to end this. I'm going to save. I just want to say, like, I don't even know what the hell I've been doing. I've been running around and just like dying and shooting random people. So. I clearly cannot talk and play one of these games at the same time. I'll keep trying. I'll save this. There's the save game. So if we want to continue on the next uh, T session, I'll just load this up and keep doing this. I like that it's clown girl. So that always makes me think of Nephilim. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because clowns are Nephilim. <laughs> yeah. All right. It was awesome. clown girl. because That was the hairstyle. Looked like a Ronald McDonald. So I just went with it. I can't believe we hung out this long. It flew by. This is fun bullshit. And it's at 420. It seems perfect. There's clown girl. She doesn't want to look at us right now. She's a little upset. She's got her back turned. It's kind of rad that it's almost been 420 that we've you went on exactly at noon and we're going to end at 420. So we're going to, yeah, we'll end it at 420 exactly. We got T minus 15 seconds here. And I'll leave us off with, uh, I'll leave us off with a sticker sheet commercial so throw out the plug secret society good guys uh every friday midnight check it out project cheney youtube thank you for hanging out with us cheney wants a love you guys Explore the unique with Paranoid American Sticker Sheets. Unearth tales of cryptids, cults, and mysteries through each sticker. These won't last long. Get yours now at ParanoidAmerican.com. With all American stickers, cryptids, cults, and killers, killers. We got all your favorite conspiracies. All the data and long on our sticker sheets. Paranoid American Stickers. Make you smile and snicker. Snicker. All the flags and secrets.
secret society. All of these and more on our sticky sheets. What the heck are you waiting for? Discover the extraordinary with paranoid American sticker sheets. From cryptids in the night to cults out of sight, each sticker is a unique find. Get yours now at paranoidamerican.com.